this is a necessary print for the Fed, uh, but, but it's not sufficient. We need to see a lot more. We are entering, I think, a new phase in the inflation debate. We are still relatively cautious given the, the ultimate outlook and trajectory for, for the economy. If the Fed is expecting to bring inflation back down to 2%, Growth is secondary, inflation is in focus. This idea of peak inflation, that's just a math problem to us. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen. After a bang-up jobs report, a bang-up CPI, a stunning market response yesterday, Lisa, every strategist has to recalibrate. Every strategist has to look forward and question, are we seeing the deceleration now that we've been looking for for so long? This was the first inflation read in some 18 that actually uh, surprised to the downside with weakening trends in terms of inflation. And the markets rallied substantially <clears throat> despite Fed pushback saying, guys, it's way too soon. We'll get to the data here this morning with green on the screen and the VIX again under a 20. We're beginning to see strategies move. Michael Purvis out front from Talbach and, and Lisa, he re just up to an abrupt move to 4,400. He says, yes, there's some challenges out there, but it's markets out front of economics. We seem to have forgotten that basic code. And not only that, but it's all aspects of the market. You saw the dollar yes, weaken, yes. for example. If you take a look at the Bloomberg dollar index, it weakened the most at one point yesterday going back to 2020. It was a pretty substantial risk on move. Usually you get dollar weakness. You had it across the board, whether it was uh, the NASDAQ getting the most since July, whether you saw credit severely rallying, all of these things kind of yeah. piecing together for a full risk on feel that's hard to push against, to your point, with Michael Purvis and right. the technicals. Kaylee Lyons in for John Farrell. He was at FCO in Rome. I'm not quite sure where he is now. He may be in at Heathrow on his way uh, home. We've been trying to get him back here for three days. Kaylee Lyons, let me give you a Bramo question if I can. And Ben Emmons at Medway writes on this, Medley, I should say, writes on this, where is Lisa says it's both equities and bonds dollar moving as well, weaker, where he says it's a double barrel short squeeze of bonds price up and equities price up. Yeah, and we definitely saw that in a huge way yesterday with the NASDAQ 100 back in a bull market. I mean, that didn't take very long, and the S&P now up 15% from its lows in mid-June. I would argue, though, Tom, that the rally in the equity market was more substantial than what we saw in bonds because, yes, you saw yields coming dramatically lower right off the back of the print yesterday, but by the end of the day, yeah. the 10-year was unchanged, and the 2-year was only down five basis points. Bramma, we got to train Kaylee to just do this better. I'm sorry, uh, uh, Lisa, we came in Kaylee from negative 50 pre misra to 10 spread and we disinverted yesterday get it a little bit but come on get with them get with the script Kaylee <laughs> well, can I just say one other thing before Please. we sound so positive everything's going great there stocks go. are going to go to the moon the, the aspects of the CPI report that were most concerning got kind of thrown out with the with the bathwater of this gold uh, feeling that was out there. The idea that food inflation came in at the fastest pace going back to 1979. <clears throat> the fact that rents are accelerating, the fact that medical costs are accelerating, all of these basic aspects. And I do wonder if we're seeing that bifurcation with used car prices coming down. That is the lower income right. squeezed group, whereas new car prices continue to rise because that is the higher income group. They can still afford it. Now, sticky inflation and Michael McHugh will help us with that with the Dallas trim, the brand ammo trim, the lines trimmed, and all the rest of the trimmed inflation reports. Let me look at the data while uh, Lisa staggers over for a brief. Futures up 12. Dow futures advance a continued 122 points. The Dow 33,381. The Dow is 10.3% from a new record high. The first time I've said that in months and months and months. And you see it with a VIX that stuns under 20 from 32 down to 20 and now 19.92 on the VIX. In the yield space, a lesser inversion twos. 3.17 uh, percent. Oil has its own story going on. Worth watching, of course, the really great challenges in Europe. Brent crude making another dash for 198 on Brent crude and dollar weakness. We'll get to that in a moment. We need a Thursday bull market <laughs> brief. Lisa, what do you have? Well, uh, just to comment, though, quickly on crude, you did get the IA report talking about people switching from gas to oil in light of some of the shortages, adding to demand that they hadn't seen six months ago. So that part is part of the story today. 8.30 a.m. we get U.S. initial jobless claims as well as PPI. These are the prices, the price increases that factories, manufacturers are seeing. How much do we see this outpace
pace what we see in CPI. And this goes to Mike Wilson's question, uh, which is, do we see those profit margins compress and continue to compress as PPI, as those prices continue to outstrip CPI, the prices that consumers are willing to pay? At 1 p.m., we get U.S. selling $21 billion of 30-year notes. I'm doing this just for you, bond auction day. Uh, Tom, I find this fascinating because yesterday after that CPI print, you had a 10-year auction that did amazingly well. And you've seen this, right? Basically, people flooding back to bonds. To Kaylee's point, you are seeing that rally in bonds. Yes, maybe it's perhaps it's more pronounced in stocks, but still there too. So how low can it go? And what does that say? Does it send a contradictory message to what we're seeing in stocks? In other words, can this continue to happen with the fact that you normally have an inverse relationship between these two <laughs> asset classes? And at 7.30 p.m., San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly is speaking in an exclusive interview with Bloomberg Television. In the Financial Times, Tom, she pushed back. She said, we still have a lot of work to do. Inflation is still very sticky. It is still way too high at eight and a half percent. We are going to do more. She did seem open to slowing the pace. But this has been the interesting feature to me. One Fed official after another has come out and said, guys, we are not going to pull back. What are you doing? Why are you pricing in rate cuts? That seems implausible. And the market continues to say, eh, we don't buy it. And I really find this a really interesting conundrum where Fed uh, officials are trying to job on the market and the market is not listening. Oh, it's, it's what happens here always is the economics is behind the markets and some would say the equity market is always behind the bond market as well. Lisa, thank you so much. Again, futures up 11. A timely way to look at the equity market up here that we're seeing is in fixed income. Brian Weinstein's done this before, head of global fixed income at Morgan Stanley Investment Management, the right guy to talk at the right time. Brian, I'm looking at the Bloomberg Total Return Index, one of the measurements and as you know, it's been ugly since the summer of last year, down 13 percent, maybe down 17 percent on bonds. And we have had a bounce. We've had a very, very nice bounce. Price up, uh, yield down in that. Is it all clear for bonds? Is it is all clear for stocks? You know, Tom, I think you and you and Lisa have been out of this morning. I mean, I think the market sniffed this one out. So we've, we've had the move, right? The move from 350 on tenure notes to 275, the move from over 600 on high yield uh, to down to, to 400. Um, so I don't know if it's all clear. I think you might be actually at the lower end of the yield range uh, for now, but it's actually pretty amazing that the bond market, uh, I think, has sniffed out that CPI has peaked um, and that there's some smoother sailing ahead. We're not done. The Fed has more work to do, um, but uh, but they've done a lot and they have a little... They they have the, the shelter components, the, the most confusing component to me, or the, the most concerning component to me. I think they, that's why they have more work to do. But the bond market, I think, has sniffed it out, and we were near the bottom end of the range. Brian, how much is this actually evidence that Fed policy tightening is working? And how much is this evidence that the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and a lack of demand for oil has made uh, oil prices and gasoline prices fall to the lowest since March? And that's really what's underpinning this entire move. It's a great, it's a great question, Lisa. I think I, I get it. The Fed did what they did. Is qu remember how quickly they moved, right? These these thinking about fifty versus seventy five. Uh, if went back a year, they hadn't moved to, you know, over twenty five basis points in one meeting in so long. So part of this is credit to the Fed. Part is because commodities have come off and demand has uh, has definitely shifted down. Um, so I think the Fed looks at this at the, as the beginning of, of their battle and having been more credible, um, but having more work to do. But do you think the Fed is happy with what it's seen in the market reaction, Brian, when you have Charlie Evans talking about how inflation is still unacceptably high? That's a quote. Neil Kashkari saying, I want to be at 4.4 percent next year, and yet financial conditions are getting easier. I think they worry that there's that there's easing priced in, right? The idea that that easy money is back out there in the future, that, that they could simply just ease again if they needed to. I don't think they see it that way. Uh, again, when I look at the shelter components of CPI, CPI is too sticky. It's not going back to two anytime soon. So they're not done. I think they need to push back hard on this market. And they may need to show the market that even though they're softening in CPI, that they're serious about fighting inflation. They can't afford to lose this fight. The rally has been pretty broad based, Brian, and it's not just in equities, but also in credit. You're seeing people pile into the riskiest debt and you're seeing it in mass. How much do you lean into that? Do you see that continuing versus perhaps a head fake ahead of what the Fed is trying to achieve, which is a significant slowdown? I think it's probably more of a head fake from these levels. Again, I think we got to some levels that were, um, there, there was just too much priced in, too much fear. And so we've gotten the balance, as I said, and you guys have been on it this right. morning. We're ahead of it. And, and now you're probably at the point where you want to start to pair risk a little bit um, as opposed to chase it. Brian, you sound like Mike Wilson. I guess you're reading from the same hymnal. Brian, if you say the Fed 
the FOMC has to quote unquote fight back. Don't they only have one tool, the interest rate tool? Yes, I used to think they had two tools. I thought they would use the balance sheet a little bit more. Um, it seems like a tougher tool for them to use. Um, so yes, Tom, I think the interest rate, the, the tool they have is the front end of the yield curve. Um, I think they will continue to push on it again. Do they need to go 75 every meeting? No, I think they've done a lot. They'll go now, it looks like they'll go 50 in September. Okay, so um, I got to pin you down on this. What's the 210 spread you see? Do you envision a negative 50, a negative 80, even a negative yeah. 100 mm -hmm. basis point 210s? Negative 100 seems like a reasonable target to me. Wow. Wow. Brian, that gives pause. Brian Weinstein starting a strong year with Morgan Stanley Investment uh, Management. He got the duplicative wow. We're waiting for Kaylee. <laughs> Kaylee, please <laughs> no, say wow. I wish someone caught my face on camera <clears throat> when he said that because oh, no. I think my eyes just bugged out of my head. She, she's not <laughs> getting the lines cam. Okay, we have the Bramo cam. No lines cam. Lisa, it was a double wow. Both of us said, wow, that's the first time I've heard a full percentage point yield differential, twos higher than tens. I think that would be a record, right? And it highlights how yeah, much work the Fed Back to has Volker to do. time. Yeah. Back to Volker time. Uh, I'm going to go <clears throat> check and see what that peak was. Yeah. How far are we from having to do that kind of move? And if that happens, again, what kind of pain is there felt out? I mean, honestly, what have we seen so far in markets? Have we seen the Fed actually take mm -hmm. effect in terms of taking the bloom <clears throat> off inflation? Or is this completely different? Is this a confluence of luck and also, uh, you know, some moves on the policy front tried to right. offset near-term uh, price increases in gasoline? In the fourth season of Game of Thrones, there's where one of the lead characters goes down into the cave and says, give me wisdom. We did that this morning with Peter Dioteris, who gives us market wisdom every day at Bloomberg. He said, watch the XPX. A and D breakout. That's what the pros are watching. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Softening inflation data in the U.S. isn't changing the minds of the Federal Reserve officials. Two of them are signaling that the central bank will stay on the path towards higher interest rates. Chicago Fed President Charles Evans says inflation is still unacceptably high. Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari says he wants the Fed's benchmark rate at 4.4% by the end of 2023. Ukrainian special forces reportedly launched a powerful attack on a Russian airbase in occupied Crimea. That's according to a Ukrainian government official who spoke to the Washington Post. Ukraine says nine Russian warplanes were destroyed in the attack. That would be the Russian Air Force's largest single-day loss in the war. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says the U.S. can't allow China to establish a new normal around Taiwan. Pelosi spoke hours after Beijing announced plans for regular military patrols around the island. She said China had been trying to push its way towards its goals on Taiwan before she led a congressional delegation there last week. North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un was seriously ill during a recent COVID outbreak. That's according to his sister Kim Jo Kim Yo Jong. She blamed South Korea for spreading the virus by sending what she called dirty objects across the border in leaflets carried by balloons. And gasoline prices keep falling here in the U.S. According to AAA, the average price of a gallon of regular gas has dropped to $3.99. That's the lowest since early March. Costs have fallen due to cheaper oil and relatively weak demand. By one measure, fuel consumption is lower than it was two years ago in the midst of the pandemic. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Tape, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. We're seeing a stronger labor market where jobs are booming and Americans are working. And we're seeing some signs that inflation may be getting to moderate. That's what happens when you build an economy from the bottom up and the middle out. President of the United States trying to keep business as usual in August. And in August, it is completely unusual for the politics and the polity of the American uh, nation. It has been an extraordinary week in politics centered around the former president, uh, Donald Trump. In all of our news of the markets and such, we're going to take some time here with Jack Fitzpatrick uh, to talk right now about what's going on. Jack, my house stopped as a child for Perry Mason. Raymond Burr came out. 
and everything was solved within 30 minutes. It was incredible how Perry Mason always solved the case. And he did it with the respect of Hamilton Berger, who was a prosecutor and iconic within the show, and some would say, piece the show together. There are loads of prosecutors and whatever the number of cases there are against the former president. How are they doing when a president of the United States pleads the fifth? Uh, it, it's it's hard to say how they're doing necessarily because when he pleads the fifth, that's in the context of this uh, potential civil suit uh, with uh, uh, from the New York Attorney General. That uh, we we still have to see if they're going to bring a case. Mm -hmm. um, it is not a great sign for Trump. Keep in mind, in civil cases, uh, a jury can be instructed to or, or allowed to consider that as a potential negative. Uh, they can infer negative things about the decision to plead the fifth as opposed to in a, crim a criminal case right. they would be instructed not to. Uh, it, we don't know yet if they're going to file that suit, uh, but it, it does seem to show some, uh, the, the former president feeling some pressure, uh, especially considering everything he said about people who plead the fifth and it, it, implications of guilt. Uh, so right. we, we don't know what's going to happen on the other side, but it doesn't seem like a great sign for him. Not to turn Bloomberg surveillance into Paris. Mason. I mean, you know, I don't have the good looks of Raymond Burr, but um, Jack, to be blunt here, and I think you beautifully explained the distinction of criminal versus civil. Politics in America doesn't care. How will Republicans respond to the TV-ness of this, of quote-unquote pleading the fifth? While we know how Republican allies of Trump will respond, because aside from pleading the fifth in this potential civil suit uh, with the FBI raiding Mar-a-Lago, there's been a ton of defense from Republican politicians from Congress uh, on the Republican side uh, defending him, demanding an explanation from DOJ. There is a lot of loyalty still uh, to former President Trump uh, among Republican lawmakers. How does it play? with voters. I, I mean, the hypocrisy of campaigning in 2016 saying uh, only the mob pleads the fifth and then consistently pleading the fifth for uh, roughly six hours yeah. uh, does, it doesn't help him. But <clears throat> on Capitol Hill with his allies, we have not seen right. that many uh, cracks in the foundation. Lisa, the Washington Post points out this morning that the pr President Trump pleaded the fifth in 1990 in a divorce proceeding. Well, not I, that I don't want anything about all, that. All I could say, I'm, I'm not going to go there, but I, I was going to say, did you just binge watch Perry Mason last night? And you I thought, did, okay, I did. let's try to figure out how we can. I crush on Della. I mean, <laughs> how we can sorry. use this preparation for the show to really color uh, color the insight that we provide today. I want to switch gears a little bit, uh, Jack, Please. and talk a little bit about CPI and what we got yesterday and what this administration can and cannot claim credit to. So they've thrown basically as much oil as they possibly can and at the market with the releases, the unprecedented releases from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. They've passed a bill that uh, may or may not have any impact on inflation. They are trying to do what they can. It's all going to take a long time. Have they done everything they can and they're not just now sitting here hoping and waiting it doesn't get worse and they start off to talk, be talking about brownouts and other types of constraints on energy usage? In the pretty near term, they don't seem to have any massive other options that they haven't already tried. And you can tell that they, they're, they're tapping all the resources they can when they're putting out uh, that amount of oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and when the conversation in D.C. has turned so significantly to much longer term uh, legislation that may or may not really affect inflation. You know, the, the so-called Inflation Reduction Act is supposed to do the that uh, partly based on reducing the deficit. It's a pretty small reduction over the course of a decade. When you talk about the CHIPS bill, you know, there, there are things that, that, that could be disinflationary in these pieces of legislation's impact, uh, but this is not something where they can flip a switch. Yeah. Uh, the, the SPR, uh, and, and, you know, maybe there could be conversations about permitting reforms. They're having that. Uh, but again, those are, that's a bit of a, a long term issue. The, in, in the short term, things they could do by election day or even a little ways off, uh, the, the administration doesn't have that many options that they haven't already gone to. Well, of course, Jack, in theory, the Democrats are going to be like, look, 
gas prices are going down, inflation is cooling off, all of that is a good thing. How will Republican messaging have to switch, considering inflation is one of their primary campaign issues and how the Democrats caused it? I'm not sure they're going to switch it. Yes, gas prices are coming down, but when we talk about that in the context of gas prices coming down below $4 a gallon, Republicans still feel good about their basic message that this administration has not had a lot of success on the economy. Uh, you know, we saw essentially a month pause in the CPI, but the year-over-year uh, -year rate was 8.5%. Uh, so Republicans are still talking about inflation. Uh, about gas prices and uh, again especially if you're thinking in terms of the midterms just a few months away uh, right. they, they they are going to hammer the Biden administration and Democrats on the economy I, I'm not sure that's going to change to any really significant degree Jeff Fitzpatrick thank you so much from Washington with a brief there on his watching of Perry Mason uh, last night Lisa let's do the dollar right now it's a weaker dollar from a 107 down to a 104 handle on DXY the euro 103.36 is a bit strong Stronger, but even sterling with a little bit of a bid, 122.05. This feels broad based, like a risk on rally that's giving a little bit of a <clears throat> reprieve to the dollar strength and a reprieve to all of the currencies that are paired with it. What I keep looking at is the WIRP function on the Bloomberg, basically, Please. where you're pricing in rate cuts. And this market is pricing in rate cuts in May of next year. Fed official after Fed official is saying. I don't saying, understand how we can do that. But I that's my point. It. And the Fed officials are basically saying this can't happen. Guys, we're not even close. And I, people are still pricing this in. And how much is that underpinning the weakness that we've seen yeah, in the dollar? Let me be careful here, folks. I understand the use of this and the use of the Bloomberg terminal is a trading game. I get that. From an economic value, I, Lisa, I just don't get it how you can get the crystal ball out to raise rates, as people are talking about, and then somehow miraculously come out with a rate reduction at some point. I probably talked myself out of a job there. Future's up 10. <laughs> Maybe stay with us. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>Surveillance. We say good morning to you on a Thursday, and it is an eventful Thursday uh, as well. Off of a bang-up jobs report, a stunning inflation report, markets on the move, and I'm going to call it a recalibration uh, weekend. Katie Lines in for John Farrell. Lisa Bramitz, I'm sorry. Every strategist, right, wrong, whatever, has to recalibrate off these two reports. Have we reached peak inflation? Does it matter? How quickly is it coming down? Is this all because of oil? Does it matter that food rose at the fastest pace going back to 19? All of the recalibrations that your Perry Mason analysts have to face. <laughs> Maria Paula Magaris Torres and Janelle Marte write a brilliant essay for Bloomberg, a reporting essay, I should say, on rent. Lindsay Piegza joins right now, the chief economist at Stiefel. Thrilled she could join us this morning. Lindsay, I want to go narrow here, and I want to go what I see as every single conversation in the Keen household. And I want to get away from the idiocy of New York or L.A., the other big cities. Miami up 39 percent. Orlando up 24 percent. Las Vegas up 16 percent. Bring it on down to even Boston up 13 percent in rent. Does anything else in the inflation report matter except housing? It does. So what we saw is the largest increase was, uh, excuse me, the largest decrease was a result of energy prices. And that's not to say that it makes the report less meaningful, but it does give me pause or it makes it more questionable that we're on a sustainable downward trend in terms of costs. When we look at other components included in yesterday's consumer report, as you mentioned, OER, the proxy that we use for shelter costs, rose over half a percentage point, food prices up over 1%. These are large components of the monthly expenditures right. that <clears throat> consumers uh, spend on. And as those continue to rise, yes, that reprieve at the pump was absolutely a welcome step in the right direction, but it doesn't mitigate the relentless rise right. in costs that consumers are facing in nearly every other sector. You know, I want to go, Lindsay, here. And Dr. Piazza, I know you've studied this. The franchise at the University of Michigan and at the Kansas City Fed, we'll join them at Jackson Hole here in a couple weeks, where they sat back 20 years ago and said, how do we measure inflation? My personal favorite is the Cleveland CPI folks, which isn't like core inflation. It can take out different things. 
but I'm seeing an upward trajectory in what is now comically called their now casting CPI. I, I mean, the fact is some of these indices have not turned around. Oh, that, that's absolutely correct. So while the market is very anxious to call a peak in inflation and the market is betting on the fact that inflation will come down meaningfully into the end of the year, alleviating a lot of pressure on the Fed to continue to back up rates, when we look at other cost pressures, when we look at other measures of inflation, there's still a lot of work for the Fed to do. And in fact, we've heard those exact words from a number of committee members that they're nowhere near done raising rates because they need to see not one month's number, they need to see several consecutive months of a meaningful retreat in costs before they're convinced that we've not only reached peak inflation, but we're on a sustainable downward trajectory in costs. Lindsay, does this report that we got yesterday make you think that a soft landing is more achievable? No, it really doesn't. Again, I'm not yet convinced that price pressures have peaked and that we are on a pathway towards the Fed's target of 2%. So I do think that the Fed will continue to raise rates beyond the 3.5% target that we saw as of the June SEP, making it a deeper, potentially more prolonged downturn in the U.S. economy. So the soft landing, I think, was achievable or could have been achievable had the Fed initiated rate increases earlier on. But now we're in a position where they're going to have to tighten at a faster pace, higher pace than they would have otherwise done if they had removed that transitory language earlier. Well, that said, Lindsay, that's been the case for a while. And what we are seeing is a number of softening aspects, softening components, particularly on the good side. The areas, though, that you pointed to, whether it's food, whether it's shelter, that rent component, that's a big one. How much, what gives you conviction that that's stickier and could drive CPI even higher than the 9.1% that we saw a couple of months ago? Well, particularly when we talk about food prices, a lot of that has to do with the supply chain, the supply side aspect of inflation, which the Fed has little control over. The Fed can raise the cost of capital, which can tap down demand, tap down investment, and we've already started to see that impact. But on the supply side, traditional monetary policy metrics can do nothing to alleviate the lack of supply in the market, the dislocations that we're seeing in terms of trade, and that's going to keep those components of inflation much more elevated than the Fed would like to see. Well, Lindsay, as Lisa said, you're seeing moderation in goods. So let's talk about services. How worried are you about services inflation and the wage pressures therein? Well, as we saw in yesterday's uh, productivity report, unit labor costs are up over 10%. Now, why is that? Well, growth slowed in the first quarter and the second quarter, but we also hired several million Americans. So as productivity remains very, uh, very minimal, as we continue to hire more workers to produce less goods, that's going to continue to put upward pressure on wages without the improvement in productivity. Yeah, and our Gina Martin-Adams, our equity strategist here at Bloomberg Intelligence, saying the equity rally with peak CPI only actually works if you see more productivity with it uh, to that point, Lindsay. So when we talk about where inflation is going to get down to, how high the Fed funds rate has to be to get it there, what rate on unemployment does that have to dictate? Well, I think we need to see uh, a meaningful in increase in the jobless rate. Right now at 3.5%, while we are checking recessionary boxes for most other sectors of the economy, with weakness in manufacturing, housing, the consumer, real income growth, real spending, the labor market remains solid. And so in order to see that meaningful slowdown in the economy to bring down inflation, I think the unemployment rate gets nearer that 5% level. So a significant increase from where we are right now. Lindsay, I'm going to ask you a question with all of your academic research and experience in the fields that's going to make Tom push back and start groaning, <laughs> which is about the historical analog of the moment that we're in. And we talk a lot about the 1970s, and that's what's going to make Tom groan because he doesn't see that. Some people will say it's more akin to the 1940s. Other people point further back in history. Where do you look for guidance as to how this is going to transform transpire and what tools will be necessary to get us back to where is more comfortable? Well, I think there is some comparable aspects to the 1970s, particularly when we talk about the supply side shocks to inflation. That being said, we are in an unprecedented market with uh, the aftermath of a global pandemic, with ongoing geopolitical conflict. 
there really is no reasonable or realistic comparison to markets right. in the past. So right now, I, I think economists, I think Fed officials, I think market participants are struggling to understand all of these different factors, this confluence of factors that are driving the market to really act irrational at this point. As we've seen, market uh, participants are ping-ponging back and forth based on one data point. We've seen the 10-year slip down to below 2.5% and then rally back above 3% based on one data point. And so this overreaction, I think, highlights the fact that there really is no historical precedent or comparison that we can look to to really understand what's happening in the marketplace. Lindsay, let's channel the late, great Alan Meltzer of Carnegie Mellon. Can you do your economics on a homogenous basis, or are we so fractured that it's a, it's a heterogeneous analysis where you're looking across quintiles and deciles of America? Oh, absolutely. There's a, a clear bifurcation in how Americans are responding to inflation. As we were talking earlier, I, I think those at the higher end of the income earning range are better able to absorb and are reflecting that better absorption rate of inflation versus those in the middle or, or particularly at the bottom. Inflation does hit those with less ability to absorb cost increases, obviously more dramatically. And that's having a larger impact on the average American, the average small business struggling struggling amid these rising cost pressures. Well, to that point on cost pressures businesses are facing, we're going to get PPI later, Lindsay. Do you expect we'll see the same moderation? Well, I do think we're going to see some reprieve in the July number. Again, as a reflection of the fact that commodity costs, energy costs did cool in July. But we are likely to see other categories, just as we saw in the CPI, continue to rise, again, giving the market uh, increased <clears throat> confidence that inflation has peaked and the Fed will back off from this more aggressive pathway. But I think economists and Fed officials are going to be less convinced even after a reprieve in the PPI this morning. Dr. Piazza, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. It was Steve for Lindsay Piazza thank you. Uh, this morning. Lisa, I'm just gl I'm glad Kaylee's here. Farrell would fail at this, but Kaylee at least keeping us on the straight and narrow of what's actually going on this morning. <laughs> Lisa, did you remember? I forgot. It's Thursday. We have claims. It's claims Thursday. I just got a text that he may not come back now. So, you know, <laughs> be careful what you ask well, yeah, for. You know, you know so. Uh, <laughs> why, why am I Why am I <laughs> So, yes, we do have a claims Thursday. We also have PPI Thursday. Sure, I guess yeah. we have a competition for which is going to be more important. I think Kaylee brings up a good point, though. PPI is going to be interesting in terms of margin pressures for companies, especially paired with that CPI print. And this alphabet soup that we're talking about basically is our businesses paying a high higher and higher prices than they can pass along to the consumers. And that's what people are well, trying to parse out with these two series. And part of it, and again, I defer to someone like Gina Martin-Adams on this or other great equity strategists, is given the turmoil that Dr. Piggs had just laid out, do we begin to see transactions and combinations affected for profit? And I would say, I can't remember, Lisa, was it Merger Monday or Merger Tuesday? But we saw some of those little transactions here. Yeah, Merger Monday. It was officially a Merger <clears throat> okay. Monday. But we're yeah. starting to see more deals come through. And how much is it out of necessity? And how exactly. much is it out of exactly. convenience? And that, I think, is what we're going to have to see okay. in terms of whether this is trying to strip out costs, trying to streamline so that they can better uh, maintain their margins. Lisa, 40 seconds here. Did you say there's another auction today? I'm so glad you were listening, Tom. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes, 30 year bonds. What's the difference between a 30 year auction and a seven year auction? One is for Seriously. bonds that mature in seven years, and the other no, is for I 30 that. years. I know that. Don't be wise. No. I, mean, I get that. <laughs> seven, seven years. What's the difference in mood? <laughs> So, so it? hold on a second. No, I'll tell you. The seven-year, the seven-year auction, they're less liquid, right? So they haven't been around as long, and as a result, or they, and they're not as traded. They're not a benchmark move, so it go. tends to be messier. That's and it's the also acute seven years. knowledge we want to see years. from Bramo. <laughs> I think we'll be back. Futures up Maybe. twelve. Dow futures up one thirty-one. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky says that Russia lost nine fighter planes in explosions that rocked an airbase in occupied Crimea. Russia denies that Ukrainian attacks caused the losses, but the Washington Post says that in fact Ukrainian special forces attacked the airfield. 
Oil output in Russia is set to fall about 20% by the start of next year due to a European Union import ban, according to the International Energy Agency. Gradual declines will start as soon as this month when Russia cuts back refining. The EU ban is set to halt most crude purchases from Russia on December the 5th. And in China, the central bank says it will protect the economy against the threat of inflation. The People's Bank of China pledged to avoid massive stimulus and money printing to spur growth. At the same time, it promised to provide stronger and higher quality support to the economy. And Disney is raising the price of its flagship Disney Plus streaming service by 38%. It's part of a plan to generate more revenue for its money-losing online businesses. The entertainment giant also wants to build on third quarter results that beat estimate for sales, profit and subscriber growth. Deutsche Telekom has raised its earnings guidance for the full year after forecasting that customer growth in the US will speed up. There also was better than expected revenue growth in European markets. Deutsche Telekom wants to take full control of the T-Mobile US business. It's become the company's primary growth driver. And gasoline prices keep falling here in the U.S. According to AAA, the average price of a gallon of regular gas has dropped to $3.99. That's the lowest since early March. Costs have fallen due to cheaper oil and relatively weak demand. By one measure, fuel consumption is lower than it was two years ago in the midst of the pandemic. Global News 24 hours a day on Aaron on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Energy markets, as you say, has been a key focus for us and will continue to be. Uh, and we would expect where the market is today to continue to see that moderation. We want to encourage this transition to where price pressures moderate uh, across the economy, but also do things that will make things more affordable for people right now. Because at the end of the day, typical families look at their monthly budget all in. Brian Deese there on the lawn of the White House in a piercing interview yesterday with Lisa Abramowitz. I thought she just crushed the NEC director uh, there. Abramowitz with us. Abramowitz, what was that like? I mean, you're talking to Deese after a bang-up inflation report, and he's got to go political and say life is grim in energy, right? Well, he basically has to say there's more work to do. We're doing yeah. what we can. Look at this bill we just passed. And my real issue is what more can they do? Are they now just hoping it all works at a time when the inventories yeah. of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve are going down? And you still have people really crimped. I mean, to that point, especially lower income <clears throat> households really are struggling. Yeah, what was interesting there, folks, is we were watching Deese on the lawn and the Bramo cam made clear uh, knowledge that Lisa Bramowitz is like, yeah, right, okay, great. Kaylee lines in for John Farrow today. Right now, and I want you to lean forward on gas under $4 a gallon. There is no one in America who writes a more detailed report across hydrocarbons than Stephen Shork. He's principal of the Shark Group. We protect their copyright. His report is absolutely definitive. Stephen, let me just go to one sentence of your, ma your magisterial uh, report. New York Harbor has the lowest inventories of hydrocarbons in a decade. Why is that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's the lack of refinery capacity, uh, Tom. I'm here in Philadelphia and 13 miles down the road from my office. Uh, we used to have a refinery just three years ago that produced enough gasoline each day to supply more than a quarter million cars. That gasoline production has gone missing, and that was a key supplier to New York Harbor. Why is New York Harbor uh, so important? Because this is the delivery complex where the future contracts are settled. So with those low inventories right. and the lack of capacity, we certainly have the uh, ingredients okay. for Prices. And that's just a window, folks, and the short's just genius here on all the details of supply and flow. Stephen Shork, what do you see in your madness about demand? Well, demand destruction right now is the key driver to lower oil prices. When we seasonally adjust the numbers, we're looking at demand destruction year over year, uh, more than uh, 400,000 barrels lower a, a day. That's 5%. But more importantly, when we look at demand relative to uh, seasonal norms, we're looking at demand destruction that's nearly 200,000 barrels a day, 2% below normal. So clearly, uh, as the saying goes, high prices are the cure for high prices. So Americans are balking at these prices and they are driving less.
Stephen, this goes to the underpinning question of what we've seen in gasoline prices. Is this uh, the reason why you're seeing inflation come down and it can lead to a soft landing because of the SPR release? Or is this a sign of a deteriorating economy that's deteriorating at a much faster pace with demand destruction that people have not really expected? Yeah, it's an excellent question, Lisa, and thank you. And over the past weekend, I did do some soul searching. Uh, am I guilty of confirmation? I have been in the camp since March that we are in an economic downturn. Now, the non-recession crowd will tell you we cannot be in a downturn because of the labor market. Labor market is very strong, but keep in mind, because of inflation, earnings are at a three-year low. So when we went back and looked at the last 14 recessions, well, what we've seen is the labor market has fallen in the first two quarters on half of those recessions. So, of course, that means at this point in the recession, labor markets were still increasing. And this makes sense because labor is a lagging uh, indicator. My concern going forward in what is keeping me in the recession camp, what is keeping me into a hard labor is uh, landing, excuse me, is the fact that, yes, energy prices have decreased and they will continue to decrease into the fall as we make the switch over to winter grade gasoline, which is cheaper to manufacture. But of course, uh, we're at a seasonal lull in demand. The other shoe that drops, and we saw this in the CPI, and this is the biggest concern above uh, energy, and that is food costs. Food costs are rising at the, as you pointed out earlier, rising at the fastest pace since the 1970s. And we look at the potential harvest uh, this fall, not only is off-road diesel price for farmers rising, farm equipment is rising, uh, all of our costs, propane prices are rising. These yeah. are all important costs to the harvest. So we're looking at continued food costs because we cannot alter our behavior when it comes to food. We can with gasoline, not with food. To Tom's point earlier, are we looking at a two or three tracked economy where you see real demand destruction at the lower tiers of income because of food, because of rent, because of some of these other inputs, whereas the wealthier individuals can keep go going to spend at Hermes or wherever, which you're still seeing continue to perform? Yes, absolutely. To your point about a bifurcated market, I, I was shocked earlier this year. I tried hiring an analyst and the demand for, for incomes and, and for perks blew my mind. I, I've been, I'm 55 years old and I'm, I'm just aghast at, at what these college grads are expecting. So yes, and they're expecting it because they're getting it. So yes, you're having that, that uh, you know, two-way market where wealthier high income earners are less impacted by inflation and certainly we've seen that in the demand numbers but clearly uh, the lower income uh, people are absolutely squeezed and shall remain squeezed for the foreseeable future Stephen Shark I guess thank you that was brilliant thank you, thank you. Thank you very much Tom. come back when the Phillies lose a game it'll be interesting <laughs> to see Kaylee did did Bramo did Bramo take a shot at me with the Hermes bow tie tilt? I mean, <laughs> I wore one of my favorite Hermes bow ties today. Am I in the timeout chair because of that? Maybe, Tom. You got to take it if you if you take shots at Lisa as well. But I think the bow tie looks great. We're very color okay? coordinated yeah, on the we, show like, today. I, I, well, I, the radio listeners probably can't see that, but my, I promise. My, my wardrobe people called me up and said you got to do Manchi with Kaylee today, but in the radio, you know. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not, I'm sure not taking matters. a shot at you. I'm just, you know, I know that that's a popular, you know, name in your in your toolbox. I do think though that there is a larger point here, right? And and it's something that we have seen where oh, the huge upper point. end. Huge point companies, Huge the point. apparel companies, the luxury retailers are actually delivering better than expected margins, whereas, <clears throat> you know, the Walmarts yeah. of the world, the right. Targets, they're the ones who are struggling. And I do not struggling. That's a little bit strong, but are performing worse than people had expected. How much are we going to see this bifurcation? Then how much can you get conclusions from the yeah, overarching well, I, mar market by averages that don't <clears throat> really speak to some of these differentials? And I'd say it's a theme to Jackson Hole as well. Guys, let's do claims here. We're, we're going to do claims at 830 or a little bit off the radar on that. And we need to get back on it. I just extrapolated out, Lisa. Where do we get the 300,000 job claims, which is a big round number? I was shocked. September 16th, 22. Yeah. 
Well, some people are looking at that That's to like accelerate. Two. So there's a Wall Street Journal article this morning that I thought was fascinating, talking about one company that was both hiring and firing at the same time. And that's what we're seeing, right? We're seeing a bang up jobs report and we're still expecting to see the number of layoffs pick up. Well, and how do you sort of understand such a strange moment in an economy that is facing a very strange post pandemic and reality? Part of that is technology and the overlay, as we heard from David Stubbs of JP Morgan yesterday. What you need to know after the big day yesterday, futures advance up 12, Dow futures up 130. The VIX stunning under 20, 19.92. Claims at 8.30. Stay with us. This is a necessary print for the Fed, uh, but, but it's not sufficient. We need to see a lot more. We are entering, I think, a new phase in the inflation debate. We are still relatively cautious given the, the ultimate outlook and trajectory for, for the economy. If the Fed is expecting to bring inflation back down to 2%, Growth is secondary, inflation is in focus. This idea of peak inflation, that's just a math problem to us. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television. After a bang up jobs report, after a bang up CPI report, a VIX under 20. Every strategist adjusts. Lisa, this weekend, the publishing is going to be fascinating. Especially pushing back against some of the expectations that the Fed's going to back away from the rate hiking when the Fed officials are saying, we're not going to back away from the rate hiking. So how do you get this sort of disbelief that you're seeing in markets that's helping to fuel this optimism? We have an absolute perfect guest for you if you're in the equity market and going, uh, Katie Kaminsky coming up here. And Lisa, I'm going to lead with Michael Purvis over at Tallback in this morning. He says, look, an abrupt move to SPX 4,400. So much of that yesterday. We're up futures up 12 right now. I mean, it's happening in real time. I know. And he's not alone. There are a lot of people who've been talking about how there is more potential upside, which raises an issue. Is this still the bear market rally that so many people uh, have said? Do people like this rally more now? Is there more conviction behind it? Because it hasn't felt like a lot of conviction. Every single person has come on this show and said, thin trading, not that many volumes. It's August. What are we doing here? And Kaylee Lyons got the short straw here. No surprise with that. Kaylee said, well, I'll follow the Fed speak. I said, good luck with that. I mean, the Fed dissonance with the market now, Kaylee, is extraordinary. They're, it's like they're in two different worlds, Tom, because you've seen the metamorphosis of Neil Kashkari, once a dove, now a hawk, saying he thinks they're going to get out to 4.4% by the end of 2023. They are not done hiking. Charlie Evans agreeing with him, saying inflation is still unacceptably high, indicating they're going to keep going. And yet the equity market seems like they're staring them down and saying, yeah, no, we don't buy that. I mean, I, I look at it, Lisa, and I look at what was published over uh, the after the CPI report, I should say, and the economist Ben Emmons, I thought was great on strategy where he said, and this is your wheelhouse, uh, Lisa, it's a double-barreled short squeeze, both bonds uh, price up, yield down, and stocks price up are getting squeezed right now. I think this is remarkable. Can we say it's the revenge of the 60-40 that didn't work at all during the first half of the year? Well, I didn't think of that. That's And now yeah. it's working yeah. in reverse gangbusters, perhaps, because people <clears throat> have gotten uh, pretty right. uh, pretty confident on that side of the scale. Katie Kaminsky is so important. I'm going to do the data check. Lisa's going to dash, I say dash, to the brief uh, here in a moment. Futures up 12. Dow futures up 134. NASDAQ green. I mean, I'm sorry. Small caps as well. Russell leading the way up four-tenths of a percent the VIX 19.91 in the yield space a lesser curve inversion nevertheless a big deal 41 Priya Misra uh, basis points dollar weaker is of important note sterling a 122.06 we'll see on that Lisa with an auction brief <laughs> something like that and just to sort of reiterate what Brian Weinstein said from Morgan Stanley earlier that you could see a yield curve inversion in that particular spread that is 100 basis points of inversion that would be basically compared Stunning. to the bull era where you saw a uh, negative 250 to 40. How much do we get back to that? Today, here's what we're watching. 8.30 a.m., we get U.S. initial jobless claims. Do we see some of those layoffs continue to pick
pick up as well as PPI for the month of July. This is the prices that manufacturers uh, and that factories pay. How much do we see a lagging behind in terms of how much you get a softening effect in the PPI? In other words, are consumers paying less, but companies still paying more to manufacture the goods? This speaks to the margin compression that a lot of people are expecting to happen later this year. At 1 p.m., here it is, Tom. The key point of the whole day, the U.S. is selling $21 billion of 30-year notes. The distinction of 30-year notes from seven-year notes is that they last for 30 years and that they pay out <laughs> rather than seven-year. But it also is a key metric of how much people have conviction that we're going to get back down to that 2% level and that it is a note of safety. Lisa, this is important. Zero Hedge led with this last night. A Goldman Sachs note of, I'm going to call it insatiable, I'm not knowledgeable enough. Lisa, in your world, is it insatiable demand for paper? Well, certainly yesterday, the 10-year auction did suggest that. And there are so many people saying it is a buy if you see yields above 2% at a time when the Fed is really committed to okay. getting inflation down there. And the longer we persist in this kind of environment, the slower growth we have uh, going forward over the longer term. These are some of the issues that not only economists are looking at and traders, but also the Fed officials who are coming out and trying to jawbone this market in a direction that it does not want to go. 7.30 right. p.m., we hear from San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly. She's speaking in an exclusive interview with Bloomberg Television. And Tom, she has come out. She has said we have a lot more work to do. When does the market pay attention or is the market right? And Fed officials are going to backpedal back right. much quick, more quickly <clears throat> than they think. This is really important now. We're going to jump to the equity markets here with Katie Kaminsky. She's chief research strategist at Alpha Simplex. And what's so important is you can't pronounce her focus at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Stochastic processes, stopping rules, and investment heuristics. I've aged saying that. Katie joins us now with an encyclopedic knowledge of math and trend. Katie, your, your, your work with Andrew Lowe and all the others around trend-based analysis leads us to one single question. Have we broken the bear market trend? That's a really good question because what we have seen lately, which I think is the most interesting from a technical perspective, is that we've seen signals really dissipate in the last two to three months. Right. And so it really feels like an in you know, an inflection point right now for us. We're still seeing sort of a net short, but it's very weak. Um, that kind of indicates that we could go either direction depending on right. what occurs. And I think yesterday just kind of showed that we might be going in a better direction than people had thought. Katie, I want to go inside baseball to Monroe Trout, Nassim Taleb, Paul Wilmot, and the others from years ago, mostly out of Imperial College. The raging debate is their value to volume analysis. Do you study volume? I don't. So volume is a good indicator to understand whether or not you can trade a market and whether or not your sizing is appropriate. But unfortunately, a lot of indicators of volume have been difficult to document empirically um, as predictive. Um, there may be exceptions to this, but I think volume is still a key metric because it really tells you something about whether or not the tradability of individual markets is there. Um, and that's how we tend to think about it as, you know, futures quants. Katie, Liz uh, McCormick of Bloomberg News wrote a story about a paper that you wrote about how pigs flew, uh, at least in your world, because you shorted bonds and you were able to deliver a 30 percent return or more in the beginning of this year, the first half of this year. Have you closed that trade out or are you still trying to short bonds here, especially after the rally? So that's a good question, because what we saw in June was a big spike in vol. We saw cross-correlation spiking as well. So signals in bonds have actually dissipated. Um, the reason we wrote this paper is that we really wanted to clarify that shorting bonds is not a fluke if we continue to see rising rates. That, in fact, when you think about a rising rate environment, you're going to have to consider the shape of the curve on whether or not there may be some tactical short signals in bonds that could potentially work. And I think this is particularly pertinent right now as we're moving from an inversion towards a slightly steeper curve right now, as we're seeing that could be an indication that things are getting better um, as long as we see that persist. Well, Katie, you say in a rising rate environment, and what we're hearing from the Federal Reserve is, yes, rates are going to keep rising. We are going to keep hiking into next year because inflation is nowhere near where we'd like to see it. So how wrong is the market now? So I think the market is a little optimistic. 
because I think, you know, it's always good to have a good number, to have a good print, to have something that brings your averages down. But most of us in the futures markets, we've already seen those moves in energies. We were kind of expecting this already. So I'd say that it's a little bit as would expected, slightly better. But what that means is that there may be a little bit of optimism over the first data point that confirms what people really want, which is things to go back to normal and the 60-40, as Lisa put it, to just be back into you know, a good place, which is basically right. what most people are used to. Uh, Katie, one final question. A lot of people are looking at moving averages and their eyes are gla glazing over. I'm a huge disbeliever in baloney like the death cross in that. Can you use moving averages right now to figure out if this is a breaking of the bear market trend? So if you do use moving averages right now, I'll tell you that your signals are going to be very mixed. Um, you're going to have a lot of indications that things look better on the shorter end, and you're going to have yep. a lot of indications that they don't look good on the medium to long term. So I'd say that it's really, really unclear. And the only thing we can say as a quant right now is that there is very little signal and there's room to move in a new direction. That was a very safe answer. Katie Kaminsky channeling George <laughs> Kleinman there in what are known as Kleinman exponential moving averages. You killed it, Katie. Don't be a stranger. Katie Kaminsky with Alpha Simplex today. Lisa, what you just heard there is a font of what I'm going to call derivative mathematics. At Bloomberg, it was led by the late, dearly missed Peter Carr and Bruno DePierre, who's not dearly missed. I saw him in the food court uh, the other day. And also people like Nassim Taleb and Paul Wilmot. This was a fermenting thing 25 and 30 years ago. And where Katie was at MIT, it was led by Andrew Lowe. What she's talking about is so important because it really goes from the first half of the year where there seemed to be some sort of linearity or some sort of feeling of where we were going to have we fully shifted now? And what are we shifting to? If it's not a revenge of 60-40, where are the mispricings and how does she get pigs to fly again? Well, I like the idea of 60-40 there, Lisa, because it's so out of favor. I mean, it's been beaten to death here, and there's something about buy straw hats in winter. I think that was Mr. Baruch a few, a few years <laughs> well, ago. But to Katie's point, are we just seeing people go back to it because it's what they know? because it's what's familiar to them versus a real uh, kind of eh, reassertion of a trend. Now, I honestly <clears throat> wonder whether the conviction that people have that longer term yields are going to remain super low and go even lower, whether that ever gets challenged as the Fed's yeah. balance sheet starts to accelerate. I like what we hear from strategists like Liz Ann Saunders and others that factor analysis, which frankly also is an MIT derivative, that factor analysis really, really matters here as well. Well, that was very nerdy, very geeky. We'll try to get to the straight and narrow coming up. Claims at 8.30. Good morning. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Softening inflation data in the U.S. isn't changing the minds of Federal Reserve officials. Two of them are signaling that the central bank will stay on the path towards higher interest rates. Chicago Fed President Charles Evans says inflation is still unacceptably high. Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari says he wants the Fed's benchmark rate at 4.4% by the end of 2023. Ukrainian special forces reportedly launched a powerful attack on a Russian air base in occupied Crimea. That's according to a Ukrainian government official who spoke to the Washington Post. Ukraine says nine Russian warplanes were destroyed in the attack. That would be the Russian Air Force's largest single-day loss in the war. North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un was seriously ill during a recent COVID outbreak. That's according to his sister Kim Yo-jong. She blames South Korea for spreading the virus by sending what she called dirty objects across the border in leaflets carried by balloons. And gasoline prices keep falling here in the U.S. According to AAA, the average price of a gallon of regular gas has dropped to $3.99. That is the lowest since early March, costs have fallen due to cheap oil and relatively weak demand. By one measure, fuel consumption is lower than it was two years ago in the midst of the pandemic. And drug makers Sanofi, GSK and Halion have now lost a combined $40 billion in market value since Tuesday's close. This has to do with the mounting concerns about litigation around recalled heartburn drug Zantac. It was a once popular antiacid that has drawn a flurry of U.S. lawsuits alleging it causes cancer. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg.
The idea that we are going to start cutting rates early next year when inflation is very likely going to be well, well, well in excess of our target, I just think it's not realistic. I think a much more likely scenario is we will raise rates to some point and then we will sit there until we get convinced that inflation is well on its way back down to 2%. The aerospace engineer, Neil Kashkari there of the Minneapolis Fed with his thoughts on the uh, place that we're in right now, as Lisa mentioned. Lisa, do we agree that Kashkari's sort of gone from dovey-like to hockey-like? Do I have that? <laughs> Kaylee put it well when she said you it's know? a metamorphosis where he went from the uber uh, dove to the uber hawk, and, and yeah. you know, he's been consistently that way. Uh, uh, an idea that just came out, and this is from the wonderful Ian Lingen over at BMO Group. Uh, Ian Lingen just making it very clear, as of yesterday, Jackson Hole became important. I am thrilled to tell you that Bloomberg TV and radio is giving a full commitment this year to Jackson Hole. They're even letting me go. I'm dusting off the two-tone Tony Llamas. I'm not going to wear the chaps, Lisa. It's too hot. Chaps. But, um, oh, dear Lord. You know, we're all going to go. And we're trying to get Kaylee Lines to go, too, but we'll see. But Michael McKee will lead our coverage uh, there with Kathleen Hayes. And uh, I, I, the British guy's coming if he's back from Europe, the British right? Guy. <laughs> well, you keep this <laughs> up. Right? Let's see what happens. I mean, yeah, John will be with us. It's going to be something. And all of a sudden, if someone is, you know, adult as Ian Lingen says, this matters. Wyoming uh, matters. Right now, what we're going to do is digress. We're going to stop the show off of the wonderful, wonderful reporting of Craig Torres and Katerina Sarajeva, who have a wonderful summary of something that has been a distraction for global Wall Street, and that is trading, so-called trading, by Federal Reserve and central bank officials. Jack Fitzpatrick joins us now from Bloomberg Government. To summarize here, Jack, the chairman and the former vice chairman, Powell and Clarida, have been cleared by various and sundry inspector generals and that, but others have not. And the question here is not so much rich guys being at the Fed, but actually the buying and the holding and the selling back and forth, like during a month or even during two months. Is that right? Uh, yeah, it, it does seem to be focused on the timing of uh, when we saw that incredible amount of volatility in uh, around March 2020, uh, there's this letter from Senator Elizabeth Warren now uh, that is expressing uh, a lack of satisfaction with the investigation into this and the amount of information that has come out of it, uh, noting that the inspector general report on this issue of trading uh, at the Fed uh, it did not address a guidance that came out March 23rd, 2020, that at least warned about, uh, you know, right. not making <clears throat> unnecessary trading. It, it seems to be more a matter of timing and if there was anything that could be considered suspicious uh, around then, probably March 2020 or so. You know, I, I look, Jack, at, at where we are here, and a lot of people would say the senator from Massachusetts is off base, she's mean-spirited, blah, blah, blah. But then you actually read the Bloomberg reporting, and you've got Fed presidents trading real estate trusts while they're talking and thinking about the financial structure of commercial real estate. That seems that's like me day trading J.P. Morgan, right? Uh, that is the concern. Uh, at, at this point, I, I think th some of the significant news here is just that even when there was a, an inspector general looking into this, uh, Congress appears to not be satisfied, or at least some members of Congress are not satisfied with the amount of information and the transparency around that. Uh, it, it's not just Senator Warren. Senator Pat Toomey has also said he has asked for information is not quite satisfied with the amount that he's gotten. Uh, so, it, you know, at a time when there's been this broader conversation, even about lawmakers mm -hmm. trading, uh, it, the, if there's a sense of a lack of transparency, that can create some pressure on its own. I, I, yeah. Senator Warren has not necessarily made a very specific allegation of this is what she thinks happened happened and why it was either unethical well, or, or anything along those lines, but they're not satisfied with the level of transparency a 
around those kinds of issues. But Jack, picking up on the lawmaker point, this really raises a question why there hasn't been something passed, even though it was proposed to uh, create more transparency or outright ban lawmakers and their significant others from trading stocks in companies, especially if their policies could potentially affect said companies. So where is that? Uh, not a lot of movement on that. That came up a, a couple of weeks ago, and as we get toward, you know, right now we're in August recess. The House is coming back just to try to pass that tax, energy, and prescription drug price bill. Uh, but with August recess and then the midterms, when you hear proposals, especially if it sounds like a good government proposal on transparency, on holding Congress itself accountable, uh, that may be an important idea, and there could be bipartisan interest in that kind of idea. Uh, but it, at this point of the year, that may be a little bit more of a, a political talking point than a piece of legislation that's about to be enacted. There, there's not really mm -hmm. a, a clear path forward for it now. It's a serious issue that a lot of people are talking about on Capitol yeah. Hill, but I'm not sure we're going to see something signed into law anytime soon. Well, Jack, you mentioned tomorrow the House is expected to vote on that Inflation Reduction Act. Is that going to be smooth sailing? Any potential hiccups? It looks pretty good. Uh, I, the one potential hiccup that seems to have gone away is uh, that the, the SALT Democrats, the Democrats who had really pushed for uh, lifting the cap on state and local tax deductions, say they're okay with this. They dropped all of the income tax measures from this bill. It gets on corporate taxes, uh, but doesn't include any increases in income taxes. Uh, and so that kind of gives an excuse to the these members, especially from New Jersey, your Josh Gottheimers and those types to say uh, we can drop that demand because this isn't an income tax bill. Uh, so it's it's been pretty quiet and, and uh, a lot of praise for the bill and not much pushback. It, it's, it's a yeah. narrow margin, but it's looking pretty good in the House. Jack, thank you so much. Jack Fitzpatrick there, caught on Earth. This is why Fitzpatrick is so good, folks. We can go to him on FOMC and trading. Boom, he's got it. It's right in on it and the rest. Lisa, this is not a small matter. I take great issue with the idea that if we go after rich guys, in equity ownership, they're not going to serve. That's all there is to it. I mean, we're going to end up with a bureaucracy maybe like the Italians and Draghi. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's the risk here. But at the same time, trading in and out of financial assets while you're in the game, I don't get. I, I just don't get it. If nothing else, it creates the image of impropriety at a time when a lot of people have lost a, a certain sense of credibility yes, in the absolutely. government. And I think that that's the issue. How do you restore trust in institutions that are uh, tasked with trying to make things now, better? Our best, our Washington economics team led by Craig Torres writing that up. Look for that. I'll get it out on Twitter as well. Breaking news, Michael Purvis in the 8 o'clock hour on stock optimism. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. In one hour, claims. We haven't talked enough about it today. I did an extrapolation out. 300,000 claims arrives in the middle of September. Based on the recent trend here, there's some actually pretty good data on that. Michael McKee will wax philosophical. He's looking again at that larger claim statistic that bundles in the last number of weeks' efforts as well. Futures up 14. They advance up a little bit lesser earlier. Futures up 14. Dow futures up 151 after the shock of the equity move yesterday off CPI. Lisa will give us the individuals here in a moment. In the bond space, you know, the curve inversion, we went from 49 basis points down to 42 basis points, a lesser inverted curve. Oil gets my attention, 98.10 on Brent crude. We'll do currencies with Stephen Englander here in a moment. Lisa, on the individual securities, what do you have? So, Tom, we've been talking all day about how the macroeconomic outlook is strange and bifurcated, and different pieces tell different stories, and it's the same with the individual stocks. Disney should Shares surging after reporting earnings yesterday after the bell ahead of the open here up almost 9% after reporting uh, better than expected results actually increasing subscriber numbers to the Disney Plus raising prices by 38% and having a solid performance in their theme parks Bumble declining 9% about the same amount ahead of the open after a reporting disappointing earnings this is the dating app that a lot of people uh, have actually clamored to in the market has done uh, really well so far this year coming off some 
some of those gains this morning. Sonos, the speaker maker, uh, ratcheted back their full year expectations. Those shares plummeting at one point down 20%, now down uh, a little bit more than 17%. But Disney was a tale of across the board, people coming back to the parks, people actually signing up for Disney Plus. But Six Flags was the opposite story, actually uh, missing estimates and uh, struggling in this environment. Six Flags down more than 12%. Just again, is this execution? Is this different types of clientele? How do we deal with this and come up with a cohesive narrative after 90% mm -hmm. of the S&P companies have reported earnings? Rivian up 1.6%. This is the electric car maker that has been decimated, down more than 60%, has not made money. And yet people going back to some of the more speculative areas, yes, it's legislation, but you're also seeing this in areas like Bitcoin. Yeah. And that's what you're seeing with Marathon Digital. All of the crypto space uh, doing really well because of this expectation that the Fed will back away from the monetary tightening. Those shares up 5.4 percent, Tom. And the VIX 19.93 showing the equity enthusiasm. As you spoke earlier with Katie Kaminsky, a really sophisticated talk about trend following and the dynamics of volume. We do now with Stephen Englander on foreign exchange. He's at Standard Charter Bank and is absolutely definitive on cross-rate analysis of FX. Lisa, uh, uh, Stephen, rather, Lisa and Kaylee want to talk to you about major pairs, dollar, yen, euro, and the rest of it. But I want to go to the Englander wheelhouse, which is to find unique cross-trades that would benefit. And you take a year up flat on their back, and you compare it with Mexican peso is an opportunity. Discuss Euromex. Well, as, as you said, the, Europe is facing a lot of challenges. The winter can be very difficult. The ECB hiking path is very uncertain if, if the Europe goes into recession. Uh, by contrast, Mexico has a lot of yield, has real yield. If you think that the Fed is going to be slowing down anytime soon, that yield is going to look attractive. And you kind of look at the chart. Um, Mex has been very resilient, even during uh, periods of risk off. Yes. And, and if there's good news, Mex has the beta, um, so it's going to match or you know, pot, you know beat euro. So we, we think you know it might not be a home run trade, but it's uh, in this environment. I'm happy for a double. So uh, happy for a double. You sound like the San Diego Padres doing it to the Giants last night. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I look, Stephen, right where we are right now in all the focus on Europe, 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 Europe. When you see so much focus on a major, what do you do? Well, you have to assess it if, if the market is wrong. I mean, and, and, you know, it's possible that the energy situation is somewhat better. Our, our, you know, my, my colleagues on commodities research are pointing out that the gas storage is actually, you know, pretty reasonable, about average for this time of year. So they seem to be able to substitute for Russia sources. So you want to be careful not to be too negative euro in a way that might blow up on you, um, which, which again points to a cross trade. I mean, it, it doesn't. You know, I, I don't think. Uh, you, you want something that will benefit if there's good news, and, and that's kind of the key to sort of take out some of the factors that you really are uncertain about. Stephen, let's uh, zoom out a little bit and talk about the dollar and how that has been the big uh, sort of risk on risk off trade over the past few sessions. Yesterday, we saw a major decline in the dollar on the heels of this better than expected CPI print. How sustainable is that given positioning, given how much the Fed still has to raise rates? Well, I'd say in Q4 or in the second half of the year, let me put it that way, that the, um, you know, I probably spent 75 percent of my time talking about the Fed and the dollar and, and U.S. rates. Um, you know, we've been talking about Europe. That's a big uncertainty. There's still COVID in, in China that's emerging. That's a big uncertainty. And obviously, you know, geopolitical aspects of uh, China, Taiwan are there, among other things. We're we, we don't think we're kind of in the clear with respect to risk. So we're, you know, the dollar trade, we think, could come back. You know, we think it's close to the top, but perhaps not at the very top right now. Whereas at the beginning of next year, we think uh, the economic slowdown will be clear. The, um, you know, rates path will become more friendly to markets. Um, and risk on is the biggest dollar negative out there. So if you can see 2023 is being a more friendly year. That's going to be a dollar negative year. Q4, we're, we're kind of on the fence here because there's a lot more than the Fed going on. 
So given that, how can much conviction can you have about being more positive about euro or even pricing in anything in some of the other regions when it really is a dollar trade, when it really is risk on, risk off, and you could see more of that risk off dollar strength heading into the end of the year? Well, you have to be really careful. There, there's a ton to, you know, grab, you know, major crosses with both hands, and there's, there's a time to be careful and wait until you think you know something that's not priced in. And I think, uh, you know, there's just a lot of uncertainty in that second half of this year, and some of which I think could be resolved. We'll kind of know how Europe is doing as the winter progresses. We'll know how the U.S. economy is doing as well. But, Steve, is essentially what you're saying it is more about a risk-on, risk-off trade than actually rate differentials, which was the story earlier this year? I, I think so. It, you know, when we do our regression statistical analysis, you find things like the yield curve slope and how the S&P is doing and um, Italy-Germany spreads are actually more important than straight out, you know, what's the U.S. five-year yield versus the European five-year yield. So I think a lot of what we're seeing is risk sentiment. And if it does improve, the dollar is kind of toast on, on, on a broad scale. But, you know, we, you have to be patient until it's clear that things are improving. And finally, just to get your thoughts kind of outside of the FX realm, but really the way we saw across asset classes markets react to the CPI. In your research, you called it a 10 out of 10 in terms of risk buying, when realistically the downside surprise was only a 7 out of 10. How comfortable are you with the pricing we're seeing and the expectation that the Fed is going to be cutting next year? Well, we actually have, have a very out of consensus forecast because we think the Fed's going to stop in November around three. Uh, but we also think they're not going to cut next year. Uh, that basically that they're going to wait and see that they, you know, if the economy is slowing and if inflation is coming off, they want to be sure they're on the right track. Um, so mm -hmm. we've said that we're likely to see a plateau in rates rather than a spike. Um, you know, so, yeah, I, I, and the Fed is clearly uh, doing a full court press right. right now saying no spike. Over the weekend, Steve Engler, and I need to get out in front of Standard Charter news flow here. Where are you on euro dollar? Are you a below parity guy and like a 0.95 statistic, or do you amend that? We're we're below parity in terms of our baseline forecast because we're concerned about how, um, you know, as we said, how risk sentiment is going to evolve, and we don't think we're out of the woods yet. And mm -hmm. you know, certainly the defragmentation tool has a lot of uncertainty around it. Uh, so we're 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 kind of. 0.98. I mean, signal that maybe the dollar's not at the top, right. but it's kind of, you know, not a mile from the top. Stephen Englander, thank you so much for Standard Charter Bank. Just definitive there. And of course, talking up a uh, cross rate, which he's acclaimed for Euro Max as well. Lisa, I've never done Euro Max, but that's what the bloom is like. You can really piece all these pieces together as, as Englander and others do. Yeah, and how much do you want to get away from using the dollar as a cross currency? Because it is a risk on, risk off trade now more than anything else. And how much does that become a theme as we head to the end of the year and then the <clears throat> beginning of 2023? Let's do this right now. Let's define DXY and Bloomberg DXY. For those of you at home taking notes, DXY is a traditional index. The Meijing Trader Partners, I can give you those percentages. It's easy uh, to do on the terminal. DXY, Euro, 58%. Yen, 14 percent. British pound, 12 percent uh, as well. The Upper West Side has a 4 percent holding as well on DXY. <laughs> Bloomberg DXY is way better math. The Bloomberg dollar index is now what the pros follow for trend and such, and it brings in, pulls in EM. And, and Kaylee, what's so important there is part of that mix is, a, is it floating or banded Chinese renminbi? Yeah, I'm glad you bring up China, Tom, because I thought the report out of the PBOC overnight was actually really quite interesting, essentially saying we aren't going to go with massive stimulus because of the threat of inflation. And when so much around the thesis around China has been predicated on China be, being willing to step in and support growth and right. interfere as it deals with COVID zero and a turmoil in the property sector, if they're worried about inflation, their ability to do that is going to be limited. So where does that leave China? Is it Looks like it's not going to reach 5.5% GDP growth. Equity still lift here this morning. Lisa, let's get out front. And some of the people we listen to have done this here. We're into claims right now. And then do we have to show up tomorrow, Lisa? Or, or <laughs> you missed tomorrow, Friday? Tom. 
I don't know. You, you missed Friday. Oh, you missed tomorrow. Oh, my word. Oh, wait. You so know. if we didn't have you missed, you wouldn't show up? Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, that's the takeaway <laughs> here. Love like it. That. But next year, next week, Very rather, amazing. we have retail sales. Yeah, retail sales are going to be really deal. key. And how much do we see some sort of bifurcation? I know this is my theme this morning, but between what types of retail is selling, right? Who it's selling to based on the income and where <clears> things are getting crimped. I believe Michael McKee is in the building. I haven't had a sighting yet. We'll do claims. And then Matthew Lizetti will join us from Deutsche Bank. Stay with us. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky says that Russia lost nine fighter planes in explosions that rocked an airbase in occupied Crimea. Russia denies that Ukrainian attacks caused the losses, but the Washington Post says that, in fact, Ukrainian special forces attacked the airfield. An oil output in Russia is set to fall about 20 percent by the start of next year due to a European in Union import ban. According to the International Energy Agency, gradual declines will start as soon as this month when Russia cuts back refining. The EU ban is set to halt most crude purchases from Russia on December the 5th. And more trouble is forecast for one of Europe's most vital waterways. The Rhine River is set to drop well below the critical 40 centimetre depth over the weekend. Below that mark, most barges hauling goods from diesel to coal are effectively unable to transit the river. Disney is raising the price of its flagship Disney Plus streaming service by 38%. It's part of a plan to generate more revenue for its money-losing online businesses. The entertainment giant also wants to build on third-quarter results that beat estimates for sales, profit and subscriber growth. Deutsche Telekom has raised its earning guidance for the full year after forecasting that customer growth in the U.S. will speed up. There also was better than expected revenue growth in European markets. Deutsche Telekom wants to take full control of the T-Mobile business in the U.S. It's become the company's primary growth driver. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. between the uh, Italian election next month, the weather, the, this uh, unusual weather, we should say, in Europe, uh, drying up the rivers, also a new supply shock, as well as the energy costs. So I think that Europe is facing a couple of shocks in addition to that interest rate differential, and that could drive the euro back to, towards its lows. Mark Chandler there on the foreign exchange, and of course the euro uh, moving out here to a 103. We just spoke with Stephen Engleter of Ch Standard Charter Bank, who reaffirmed through parity to 0 0.98, and that seems to be the call here, even with the dynamics of a bang-up American uh, jobs report and a really interesting inflation report. It's moved markets, and we see that this morning. S&P futures advance out to the 20 level, up half a percent, and even the Dow putting it on up 172 points as well. Critically, the VIX below 20. We digress right now and do what is unusual because the stereotype and conceit is American investors, American tourists bombarding Europe as we're seeing this year. Andrea Bonami is a founder of Invest Industrial, and he is someone who believes in investing in America. He's done this in any number of forms. And what I would say is, and he's done this beautifully here, he's invested in Ducati. Matthew Miller, of course, with a nodding acquaintance with that. And what is so great about Ducati, Andrea, is it's right next to one of the best Italian restaurants in New York, Alto Paradiso. I love how you put that together. A great Italian restaurant next to Ducati. Not by design, so, but, uh, but, but... By design, <laughs> but trust me, it works out. I've done it too many uh, at times. I want you to tell us with the transactions you did today, and they're smaller and they have to do with this, no. that, and the other thing in food, your belief from Italy in American investment. Describe that. Absolutely. Um, well, if you look at the United States for successful Italian companies, is the single biggest market. It's the single biggest growth market. We have about 8,000 employees across, uh, <coughs> across the group. Mm -hmm. And the United States will remain uh, uh, important for us. So I think there is no difference whether one looks at political or exchange rate issues. In the medium term, the U.S. will remain 
a very important market for successful Italian companies. You do something like confections where you're making little chocolates that I can't afford, but they're all over my house. I get, yeah. I, you know, I get the, I get the drill. Yeah. But what it's about is a technology conceit of America. We think we do technology better than Italy, better than continental Europe. Do we? You do technology better, but we do industry better and we do brands better. So I think Italy is the single largest industrial uh, producer in Europe after Germany and uh, our strength uh, will come through and, uh, and, and the growth in the United States will, 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 will support us on that. Andrea, I'd like to get to the Italian economy, which has been really a, a pinpoint, a pivot point for a lot of discussion. Yeah. But before we do, the conviction to buy, the conviction to make a deal right now, as people talk about record uncertainty, and you see money, cash, piling up on venture capital funds at a record pace, where do you get that conviction? You get the conviction because private equity is supposed to invest in moments like, uh, like this. Our, our usefulness to the world is to provide liquidity when other people are, are, are scared or, or are pulling back. And usually people pull back when, they're, when you're supposed to invest. So this, uh, this investment that we've just done in the United States, which has about two and a half billion of sales to our food uh, buildup, um, is, is important. And you can do it because there are moments like this where supply chain issues, exchange rate issues, ESG issues, wars, etc., are, are, are impacting the market. And this is the moment where you are supposed to continue investing, not pulling back. Andrea, is it safer for you to invest in the United States right now than the Euro region based on the tightening plan that holds more uncertainty there based on the state of the economy, based on gas prices, based on what we hear about, which is fragmentation of the Euro project? Uh, in the short term, yes. In the medium term, no, as prices in Europe are, are becoming very good uh, right now. So we will continue both, uh, both tracks. Okay, Andrea, so that's where regionally you're investing. Let's talk about company specific, the kinds of companies you are putting money into. You're making food related deals at a time of very high inflation pressure for some of these companies. How do you navigate that challenge? Absolutely. Uh, so right now you've got raw material uh, price inflation, you've got problems with supply chain, you've got an, on, an onshoring of, uh, of, uh, of uh, if you want, sourcing. So there are tons of issues right now in the food industry. But if you look in the medium term, uh, food is the biggest challenge we have on the global economy today. Security <coughs> of food, safety of food, quality of food, quality of ingredients. So we're doing these two major build-ups. One, in the ingredient side, where we have reached about a billion in sales, and one which is three and a half billion, which is our our our, our private label. Uh, one of the, both deals today are on those two <coughs> two ends of the market, and this will will are, are spot on where the world is going. So it, you'll see major changes in your, in food, and food will become a central issue, uh, also because right. of the droughts, etc. So it will be. It will be, you mentioned technology before, it will be as big as technology, I think. Uh, Andre, I've got to talk to you about what matters. And what matters is, I, you know, I looked for your letter to me on the Taylor Swift graduation at your New York University as yeah. well. This was a huge deal in Manhattan. And I think what was really missed about Ms. Swift speaking at Yankee Stadium to your NYU was this is a kid who never went to college. She did high school and literally because of her acclaim, worked out at airport terminals as she studied. What was it like having a kid that never did that show up at NYU? Well, I'm only a board member at NYU, but NYU Yeah, but you is, got tickets. A, I didn't. That's what matters. <laughs> NYU is a, is, is, a, is a university which was born out of this city, and this city is a, is a city which gives opportunity to everybody. And it goes to your questions about also the United States. The United States is a place where you can have okay. opportunity, we, and that's... And that's what NYU is there for, we, and that's what, what I think the other states i got to make some for. news here. I got the editor-in-chief <laughs> just emailed me, and this is, this is boring. Make some news. <laughs> How do you top Taylor Swift at NYU? Are you going to have Mario Draghi speak at NYU next year? I don't think Mario Draghi will get, uh, will get the same reception as Taylor Swift. <laughs> Great. I mean, not, not even close. <laughs> okay. Not even close. But now he's digging a hole for himself with the he's, industrial. He's, he, exactly. He's, uh, 
he's a good manager, but no, I don't think that that will be that will be. That's going to be across close. all of the Italian newspapers tomorrow. <laughs> Andrea Bonami, thank you so much. With Invest Industrial digging himself a hole in the Italian press, I'm Mario Draghi. I mean, Lisa, you say it, but Mario Draghi. Is, what do we think, Elise? Is he looking for a job? <laughs> is he looking to saying, "Look what you made me do," or mm -hmm. uh, you know, perform otherwise? Let's see. You can ask him. Uh, it'll Next be time interesting. You're in Maybe we'll Maybe see him. Trip. We may see him at Jackson <laughs> Hole. Seriously, you, you wonder if he'll show up. Well, yeah, especially Jackson because Hall. that is one of the main issues <clears throat> in Europe right now. Is what do you do right. if you have a government splintering at a time when the ECB is trying to protect some of the peripheral regions from having their spreads blow out too much as they tighten policy? I mean, not to bring it from Taylor Swift to Nerdville, but you know, honestly, this is a, a real issue right now, especially given uh, the lack yeah. of willingness by some of the other nations. Elisa, really um, I, I, I can't pronounce it. Kylie, Kaylee, Kylie <laughs> ha, emails ha, in ha. and says, Peyton Manning spoke at the University of Virginia. He did. He threw that, footballs into the crowd. He threw, Nothing Taylor will ever top Swift that. did not throw <laughs> footballs. It, maybe she threw baseballs into the crowd at Yankee Stadium. Oh, Pharaoh, you can't return fast enough. Futures up 18, down futures up 165 in 30 minutes. Claims key economic data. This is Bloomberg. The market's not believing that the Fed has yet done enough to bring inflation down anytime soon. I don't think markets are currently pricing in a severe recession outcome. This is not every group, every stock, uh, every index working. I think when we get past the summer, we could start to see more volatility then. As these forces gather steam, I think the market's concluding that the Federal Reserve is going to break something. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Countdown to jobless claims, countdown to PPI from New York City. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning. We have John Farrow, Tom Keene, and Lisa Abramos. But John Farrow is off and Kaylee Lines very much in, which we are very happy uh, about. Tom, we have to look at some of the data that's coming out in about 30 minutes' time. We've got uh, PPI coming out and jobless claims. Which is more important to you? Well, I think uh, the claims is most important here because it will validate the worsening labor economy if we continue to see a rising uh, claims number. I'm sorry. High-frequency data like weekly claims and continuing claims to me is always, always more important. That's Carl Weinberg 101 uh, to, to speak of one person who likes that. Drew Mattis, I know over at MetLife, uh, feels the same way. Lisa, I think the economic data in whole has to follow on from bang-up jobs, Bang up CPI, and that has changed the tone of the market. Witness futures up again today. Yeah, you can see the NASDAQ uh, surging up about a half a percent. It sounds like it's not that much. Surge coming right uh, more than 20 percent off the lows that we saw back in June time. You have to wonder right. how much further it has to go, whether the market's gotten ahead of itself. And a lot of notes that have come out this morning say, no, it hasn't. Actually, it has more to go. You know, Michael Purvis with us here in 15 minutes. Will re, uh, must listen for the bears as he goes decidedly the other way. Single most important note this morning, at least from Bloomberg's Ira Jersey on fixed income. And Lisa, this goes to the heart of the matter. Nominal labor income growth. I didn't know this. It's 9% plus. Wow. That's, and on radio, that's Ira Jersey's exclamation point. 9% plus nominal labor income growth. How can that be negative for America? Well, it's only negative if you see uh, CPI reassert itself to there the upside. Go. Well, this is what we were hearing from Lindsay Piegza. And honestly, Kaylee, this is what a lot of people are looking for in PPI, which is mm -hmm. it is the margin. It is not the yeah. absolute. It is not the nominal. It is how compressed are things getting. And with PPI, it's going to be important for that Mike Wilson projection of shrinking uh, margins going forward. Exactly right, which is why he has been so bearish on this equity market consistently. He thinks the bulk of that margin pressure and the earnings downgrades are going to sh show up at the latter half at the end of this year, which raises a question of the fundamental backbone of this rally. Is just this a melt up? People getting excited about the idea of a dovish pivot from the Federal Reserve because inflation is cooler, but that doesn't make inflation cool. And on the producer prices, if you're still dealing with those higher input costs and a lack of ability to pass that on, that doesn't leave corporate America in a brilliant place. Yeah, certainly it's leaving the market in a better place. And right now, 
Tom. We're look, seeing the revenge of the 60-40 with bonds and stocks rally. You could yeah. argue which has been uh, seeing a bigger rally, but nonetheless, it is broad and it is uh, sticky. No question about that. And I like how you bring up the 60-40 because it's been out of favor, to say the least. Yeah, and what we're seeing today is yields coming down across the yield curve, although you're seeing a lesser inversion. Ten-year yields, 2.74%. S&P and NASDAQ futures, both about a half a percent, 42.30 on the S&P. Uh, a bit of crude strength, which I find interesting, Tom, given what we had seen in terms of weakness, steady weakness, and now all of a sudden that IEA report, which we haven't talked enough about, that came out this morning that said that they're actually increasing potential demand because of the transition, people substituting from gas with oil to get ahead of a potentially a difficult winter uh, over in Europe. Tom. I'm watching $100 a barrel, Brent crude 98.40, up a stick today, but it's been, I'm going to say that's been the upper end of the range. To break out to a higher statistic uh, would be interesting. And right now, we're just trying to understand how much conviction this rally does have. Jim Paulson said he thinks he has conviction, which gives a lot of conviction to the conviction. <laughs> Chief Investment Strategist at the Luthold Group. Jim, you've been bullish. Uh, you've been then a little bit pulling back, and now all of a sudden, the melt-up has begun something a little bit more concrete. Do you buy into this, or do you see this as a head fake? I, I, I'm on the buy into it uh, side, Lisa. I think that a uh, couple things for me, I think, is at the forefront. You know, we talk about the Fed a minute. I, I think the case for additional Fed tightening is rapidly dissipating. I mean, we, we brought uh, real GDP growth down to a crawl um, overall. Um, I think there's still downside momentum on growth as we go through the balance of this year. The past tightening policies of money growth slowing, fiscal growth slowing, dollar rising, yields rising is likely to keep real growth sluggish. On top of that, the inflation evidence just continues to get more and more pronounced. I don't know how long it'll take to come down, but clearly the momentum is down well, hold on, a second, uh, Jim. on inflation. I think by September, we're, we're going to see the Fed case for why keep hiking kind of dissipate a little bit. And this I'm is sorry? no, I, I mean, I, I don't mean to interrupt. I, I'm just thinking about what you're saying and that we are seeing increasing evidence that inflation is coming down. The pushback I'm sure that you hear and you're going to hear it a lot is not when it comes to rent, not when it comes to food, not when it comes to medical costs, not when it comes to how much you're paying for services. So, yes, you are seeing disinflation in some areas, but it's not as broad as many people <clears throat> would like to see. What gives you conviction that we're seeing the beginning of something that is going to broaden out later this year into next? Well, I, I think that having real economic growth, you know, zero to two percent is a, is, a, is a big part of it. Having the past economic policies, they have lags and they're going to continue to be a negative downward force. The reason inflation peaked in the March, April, May period was because a year earlier, fiscal growth peaked, monetary growth peaked, dollars started to rise, yields started to go up. That is about a one year lag policy has on the economy and inflation. And that lag is going to continue to be negative going forward. Also, you know, you, you can always pick parts of the inflation center that are still hot, but there's a lot of parts that aren't. And, you know, the inflationary thrust of commodities, which was driving this to, at the leading edge, is now a deflationary thrust overall. You know, the core rates of CPI, PPI, PCE, have now all decelerated year on year in the last three to four months. Uh, annual wage inflation was 6.5% on a six-month basis at the end of the year. It's now 4.7% or 4.3% on one of those. I can't remember. But it's yeah. a big deceleration in, uh, year to date. So I, I think, I think the, the debate on inflation has peaked. I think that's over. And now it's a debate on how fast it comes down. Right. And I'm just saying, you, you know, by September meeting, we're going to get more claim numbers that probably will show a little more weakness. And um, I think the case is going to start to go away. But beyond that, th this is really why I'm more bullish. I don't really care what the Fed's going to do because the Fed isn't driving this ship. The, if I look but at what's happening, we're already into a brand new easing cycle right now. But bond, Jim, bond yields from two years to 30 years have already started to ease. The dollars rolled over. It's already started to ease. Junk spreads have gone from over six to under five. They've started to ease. Real money growth at minus 3.2 percent. It yeah. can't go much lower. I think it's going to start to improve because inflation comes down and fiscal growth has already started to go back okay. to easing. So do you want to miss an easing cycle? 
Jim, I totally hear you. Yet at the same time, I also hear Federal Reserve officials like Neil Kashkari saying we are nowhere near done. We still have so much tightening left to do because inflation <clears throat> is still very far from our target, even if, yes, it is moderating. Clearly, you aren't in that camp. But as you talk about all of these things that are changing, financial conditions that are easing and the Fed not being in control, does that not mean they are going to be even more aggressive to get that control back? Well, I, I think it's interesting how much attention we devote to the Fed because the Fed's been behind the curve the whole time. Fortunately, inflation's coming down today, not because the Fed lifted the funds rate for the first time in February this year, because monetary growth, fiscal growth, dollar growth, yield growth were tightening all last year, and that's what's bringing the slower yeah. economy and slower inflation. So now, why the Fed's still behind the curve? But all the markets are right. going the other way and starting to ease. So why should we continue to give so much dominance to the Federal Reserve? Jim, we had uh, Katie Kaminsky on from MIT here earlier, and it sprawls out to your Iowa State with the rigor of mathematics and the rigor of trend, the rigor of a time series being all when we look at the equity uh, markets. How do we move from what's an obvious short squeeze, futures up 21, Dow futures up 183 two days in a row, to a constructive bull market trend. How do you transition from an obvious short squeeze out to a durable trend? Yeah, I, I think it's a good point, Tom. You know, eventually, to keep this going, we'll, we'll have to decide that we're not going to recess. So that, that, to me, is almost becoming the bigger issue than inflation right now is, are, are we going to recess soon? If we're not going to recess, then I think that gives you a fundamental undertow to your, to your point of giving sustainability. In the short term, though, we're dealing with a lot of bears in the sidelines, a lot of sellers that have come out, and, there, and we're dealing with some uh, technical levels that are right there in front of us right now, the 4,200 level, the 4,222. And if you break through some of those, then you're going to see right. a lot of the technicians that have been bearish change tune, and that could bring right. some buying in that could sustain, could sustain this for a while. So it's, if we fail it, you know, then we probably have some downside because it's probably ahead of itself. But if we break through that, then I think you could convert mm -hmm. some bears and bring some sustainability for a period. Jim Paulson, brilliant with Louisville. Thank you so much. Greatly, greatly appreciate this morning. And Lisa, this goes to your auction uh, ability where the demand out there seems to be so great. And as Jim Paulson says, those on the sidelines in bonds and equities, that's a substantial group right now. Yeah, and that's the reason why you're going to have more people who are going to come in. I'm just still thinking about this. He's saying you don't want to miss an easing cycle. There are signs that it's already begun. It doesn't matter oh, what the Fed Lisa. says because oh, they've been things, behind the curve things, on the way up with inflation and they're behind the curve on the way down. That's fascinating. I, I will state really this. It's horse and cart. One of the hardest things to understand in any cycle is markets are always out front of the cart, which is monetary authorities. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Softening inflation data in the U.S. isn't changing the minds of Federal Reserve officials. Two of them are signaling that the central bank will stay on the path towards higher interest rates. Chicago Fed President Charles Evans says inflation is still unacceptably high. Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari says he wants the Fed's benchmark rate at 4.4 percent by the end of 2023. Ukrainian special forces reportedly launched a powerful attack on a Russian airbase in occupied Crimea. That's according to a Ukrainian government official who spoke to the Washington Post. Ukraine says nine Russian warplanes were destroyed in the attack. That would be the Russian Air Force's largest single-day loss in the war. And gasoline prices keep falling in the U.S. According to AAA, the average price of a gallon of regular gas has dropped to $3.99. That's the lowest since early March. Costs have fallen due to cheaper oil and relatively weak demand. By one measure, fuel consumption is lower than it was two years ago in the midst of the pandemic. Drug makers Sanofi, GSK and Halion have now lost a combined $40 billion in market value since Tuesday's close. That has to do with mounting concerns about litigation and around a recalled heartburn drug, Zantac. It was once popular antacid that was drawn a flurry of US lawsuits alleging it causes cancer. GSK's loss is its biggest since 1998.
Another month, another record for apartment rents in Manhattan. The median rent on new leases last month was $4,150. According to appraiser Miller Samuel and brokerage Douglas Elliman Real Estate, that's up 2.5% from June and 29% from a year earlier. The median rent has set a record in each of the past six months. Global News 24 hours a day. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. that the headline number was going to be coming substantially down because we could see what had happened with gasoline prices. The core number was better than most people uh, expected. Uh, that's certainly better than the alternative uh, to that. Lauren Summers uh, speaking there on the Fed, on the choices, on the optionality, the degrees of freedom that any given central bank as he's been someone who says, look at inflation, here's what it is. It's going to be interesting to see if he visits Wall Street Week this week and uh, where Professor Summers is on the inflation report that we've seen. We're 12 minutes away from an incredibly important claims report. Yes, PPI uh, is, well, I guess final demand PPI will be of interest, but claims to me is absolutely front and center. This is what we like to do. We are driven by the research of our guests. And when someone writes a piercing note, we say, Michael Purvis of Tallbacken, we don't care that you're living large in Spain. We need to speak to you. In the Spanish afternoon of a 4 p.m. with a sangria or a martini by his side, Michael Purvis joins us on optimism on the market. Michael, I would predict every strategist, every market savant has to come out this weekend and adjust. How did you adjust this morning? Well, look, I, I've, I've been arguing that the recession, um, uh, economic contraction, was, was really a pretty speculative argument. That, that was the argument that had been made uh, pretty substantially. And just in the last two weeks, we've had the three most important economic data points, you know, the ISM, the services ISM, the non-farm payroll, and then the inflation yesterday come in just the way you want them in terms of affirming that right. they're not necessarily in a high inflation, negative growth, or contractionary condition there. So um, what it, when you look at positioning, Tom, um, and this is both Treasury positioning and equity positioning, it is extremely bearish on both, on both sides there, right? So the market is there's, there's a vacuum there, and when you have those three important data points line up, you're looking at Q2 earnings that have actually the beats on earnings from both revenues and earnings were better than the Q1 beats. You're looking at a situation where where the market's going to move higher. So I have a tactical call up another 200 points to 4,400, and my year-end call I've adjusted to 4,500. Uh, well, there, I'm not saying we're completely out of the woods, but I think. The, the, the certainly for the near term, the, the water's going to move higher, not lower. Michael, how much is your conviction right now underpinned by this idea that we just heard from Jim Paulson, which is that we are at the beginning of an easing cycle, that inflation is rolling off much more quickly than the Fed is expecting, and that they're going to have to catch up with the market? Look, I, I think there's a, uh, you know, sort of looking at the euro dollar futures curve and looking at the uh, I think it's 50 basis points right now of cuts next year. I think that's an aggressive assumption here. But I, from a from an, uh, how assets trade point of view, if we see some stability where sort of peak hawkishness, this, going from this Fed pivot of just a year ago being ex categorically dovish to now sort of categorically hawkish, right? That's one of the most aggressive pivots in Fed policy. So you're going to have that asset prices disrupted, and we've had that, right? Well, so I think right now that that is in. And so whether we get 50 basis points, 75 basis points, or zero basis points in cuts in 23, I think as long as we can look at something that's resembling some sort of stability in the bond market, that's almost more important than, than you know, uh, what the average well, – uh, expectation but for your dollars. Is. Michael, how much do you take a look at this idea that you had the biggest increase in food prices going back to 1979? Rents are surging. You see areas in non-discretionary spending that are crimping the average American household balance sheet, and that has yet to fully play out. How do you factor that into your bullish thesis? Well, that's a very good, a very fair point. And I do think there's very strong arguments for a lot of components of inflation to stay 
higher longer, right? But I think the question is, is if the markets and the economy can sort of adjust to that, right? Um, uh, there, then I think the the paces of those sort of inflationary surges are going to be very different than what we've seen over the last nine months, right? It's it's really the surge in in in, in, in the velocity of these inflation trends that have really uh, you know uh, disrupted the markets. If we get to a point where where you know we never get down to two percent and we're sort of adjusting to a new normal because of uh, you know reglobalization, uh, deglobalization, relocalization, higher food prices, uh, energy supply that never really fully um, expands, so that yeah. oil gets down to fifty bucks again, then I think you can look at a condition where where that those types of dynamics will play out in a much slower and basis, and the economy can sort of adjust to them. It may be the ten year doesn't go back to 2%, it may be that it's 3 to 4%, but if it stays there and, and, and then you can have the condition for risk assets to be supported. Is there going to be fundamental support, though, when we're thinking about earnings? Because as we talk about these inflationary pressures, there has been a lot of warning on the more bearish end of the spectrum from Mike Wilson, uh, for example, about margin pressure coming on. And as I now look at an S&P 500 trading back at a multiple almost at 19 on forward earnings, when are we going to start to maybe have a problem with that denominator? Yeah, well, the, the earnings question, you know, like earnings uh, bottoms up consensus Estimates compiled by uh, Bloomberg are up about six and a half percent from the beginning of the year. That's unusual. Usually, they go down through the year. There and the Q2 numbers have been generally pretty good. I think it's important to recognize that that if you have a high inflationary environment without an economic, a major economic contraction, right, meaning PMIs in the 40s or 30s, right, you will have high earnings growth in the 1970s. You didn't have a great real GDP condition. You had this had a lot of inflation, but earnings growth was literally twice as high in the 1970s than it was in the 1960s when real GDP averaged like 4.3 percent for that decade there. And I think that's one of those things that high nominal GDP can wash away, can actually help margins for many companies, right? And certainly the top line is inflated by revenues as well. So you're not seeing a lot of margin compression. The other story, the mar- and I'm, again, I'm talking about the S&P 500 index level, right? Obviously, there's a lot of specific right. cases, sectors where there's a lot of vulnerability. But if you look at the, the I think, 13 percent right. net income margin that's being being expected well, by uh, forward estimates, that is that is Tom, that is um, that is buttressed okay. by tech, and and <clears throat> tech has been. Um, Shown resilience. Right. Michael, you know, we got to leave it there, but on behalf of Kaylee, Lisa, me, and John, I just got to say, Tomar una bebida de su elección. Nailed it. Did I do okay there? <laughs> Have a beverage of your choice, we say to Michael Purvis in Spain as he slips into the Spanish late afternoon. A trooper to be with us today. Coming up, Michael McKeon claims this is Bloomberg. Economic data, retail sales next week, but right now there is a Seattle slew of economic data. And here to give perspective, particularly on the high frequency claims data, is our Michael McKee. Michael, frequently we talk on Thursdays. <laughs> frequently we talk on Thursdays when we get the uh, jobless claims numbers. And right now we're looking at uh, 262,000 for the uh, last week in terms of of jobless claims, which is a little bit higher than the previous number. I'm still waiting for the release to load to see what the revision is and see if it's a major change. We look at continuing claims. They're 1,428,000. That's up by 14,000. Actually, by 12,000 from last month. So not a huge level of ongoing claims, which tells you people are still able to get jobs. They're on uh, unemployment claims for a brief period of time. PPI, that's the one everybody's watching for. And here is some interesting news. The final demand PPI, which is what companies get for their products, down half a percent 
during the month of July, and that pushes the year-over-year rate down from 11.3 to 9.8 percent. That is kind uh, of kind of interesting. Uh, the X Food and Energy. Um, Sort of the traditional core is up only two tenths. The forecast was for four tenths. That was what we saw last month. And uh, X Food Energy and Trade up two tenths. That was forecast to be up four tenths. Right. So the annual rates for uh, the core rate seven point six down from eight point two, and uh, well, Energy Food and Trade five point eight down from six point four. So. A weakening of inflation. Prices. Well, let's talk about that in a moment here, and then we'll go to Matt Lazzetti. But the markets lift on this futures up 31. That's S and P futures up 31. Dow futures pop it to 263. Nasdaq up seven tenths of a percent. The VIX hasn't moved yet, but I wonder if we're going to see an cool. 18 handle on the VIX lease. It would be something. And two year yields come in uh, pretty significantly <clears throat> even after they've declined earlier. Yeah, this seven, basically confirms yeah. the view that we had seen yesterday from CPI. Now you've got that two year yield down to 3.13 percent uh, and that just under one point right uh, yeah it's just fascinating to me see further, the confirmation further dollar weakness as well is this a mirror we, image of what we saw yesterday uh well not a mirror image which would imply reversed but this is a, a, a an image that matches kind of what we saw yesterday uh, the initial jobless claims uh, by the way, last week revised down from 260 to 248. So this number is telling us that the labor market is stronger than even we thought and is not necessarily getting worse, which some people were worried about. And inflation pressures have started to ease. Uh, Looking at the overall producer price numbers, um, looks like a 9% drop in energy uh, is what is responsible for that uh uh, half a percent drop in final demand goods, which is not going to surprise anybody. Um, but the index for food and for final demand goods, less food, right. rose one uh, percent. So we're still seeing some food inflation out there. That's what I was going to say, Mike. How much is this a head fake? And I keep using that word. I, how much is this giving perhaps the wrong impression because it's all tied to oil prices that even if they stabilize here, won't provide the same kind of tailwind to this deteriorating uh, inflationary impulse that a lot of people are counting on right now. Well, a lot of energy products go into other products, so they do have an effect. It takes a while to get into uh, the price indexes, but that, so, you know, as we go along, that should be good news. But it does suggest that uh, we are seeing uh, an energy driven uh, inflation area, except for the well, overall number is. Uh, still not matching what we saw the prior week. Um, services ended up only one-tenth percent higher, and services uh, were a, a big mover in yesterday's CPI. Okay. Just so it, this is good news. we got to leave that here, Michael, and that is good news. It was good news to have you with us yesterday, and I can just say it has changed Jackson Hole just in what we've seen in 48 hours. Michael McKee with all of our economic uh, coverage. Right now, the right guy to speak to at this time, Matthew Lozzetti is chief U.S. economist at Deutsche Bank, and you know as well, for those that keep track, he was way out front in calling for some form of of economic contraction in America. Matt Lazzetti, with the data we've seen on jobs, with the data we've seen on inflation, CPI and PPI, can you and Peter Hooper reaffirm U.S. recession? Sure. First, thanks so much for having me. I think it does reaffirm our view, which is that we're not in a near-term recession in the economy. Certainly, the labor market data we saw last week, the jobless claims data are kind of edging higher, but still at very low levels. A labor market that is very tight, I think, all suggest that we're not heading into a recession imminently. Uh, however, I think it does point to a labor market that is still tight, wage pressures that are still well above the, the what would be consistent with the Fed's objective, uh, unit labor cost growth that is, you know, above 5 percent, and inflation pressures, which, yes, they are coming down, but I think are very far away from the Fed's objective. We saw trim mean CPI yesterday, 45 basis points month on month, 7 percent year on year. And so we would stick with our view that uh, we still have a recession. That recession is likely next year, around the middle of next year. And it still remains one that is Fed-induced as, as the Fed continues to tighten monetary policy. But, Matt, do you actually expect this to be a less severe recession than you had perhaps a couple of months ago based on this decline that we've seen both in CPI and PPI? Yeah, we, we had as a baseline what I would call a moderate recession. We had uh, the unemployment rate rising. You know, it doesn't seem like moderate, but, but two percentage points. Uh, and something that would be kind of akin to what we saw in the early 1990s, about a 1% decline in, in GDP. 
I think the, the key reasons for that were, one, you have private sector balance sheets that are in good shape. Uh, two, kind of the cyclical sectors in housing and autos have been supply constrained. Um, and three, you know, that, that you did have monetary policy that, you know, would, would ease next year um, and, and kind of help out. I think on the margin, you know, certainly the inflation data um, this week was weaker than we anticipated. I think it does help our call for the Fed to move rates by 50 basis points at the September meeting. And it's just really a question of do we see these downside misses persisting? I think given the trim mean data, we continue to see uh, inflation over the coming months that is well ahead of the Fed's objective, which means that the market's pricing of the terminal rate is probably too low at, the po at this point. So where are some of the inflationary pressures coming from? We've been talking about food rising at the fastest pace since, since 1979. We've been talking about rent on a tear. We've been talking about medical costs. How sticky are these particular elements as we see energy prices uh, really cool off, as well as some of the other issues with respect to goods? Yeah, I think the ones you mentioned are the ones that tend to be sticky, especially rent and OER. And, you know, those are the ones when you look at the minutes over the past year or Fed officials' comments, those are the ones that they're concerned about because they're, they're sticky, they're persistent. Uh, and also Fed research shows that as they tighten monetary policy, uh, it kind of pushes uh, down uh, housing affordability, mm. pushes people away from home ownership into renting and can push up rental prices for a period of time. The other point that I, I would note, uh, and particularly for the PPI this morning, is healthcare inflation uh, is likely to be rising possibly substantially uh, for the PCE healthcare, healthcare gauge over the next year. And that's simply a function of underlying wage pressures that we're seeing in, in the hospital and healthcare sector. We think that adds about 50 basis points to core PCE over the next year. So that is an important inflationary impulse for the Fed uh, that is upcoming and we haven't actually seen yet. Which is why we continue to hear Fed officials, even after the CPI, saying, look, our job isn't done. We still have a long way to go to get inflation down to target. But, Matt, it raises the question of how high the bar is, meaning how high a rate of inflation are they ultimately going to be willing to tolerate? Is 3 or 4% going to be the new 2%? Do we have to make that adjustment? You know, I think we heard some strong comments from Governor Waller uh, before the last FOMC meeting on that point. You know, it was noted that over prior months, we had 0.3% type core PCE prints. And he was asked if, you know, if that was sufficient. And, and what he said is that that annualizes to about 4%. That is more than double our objective, and it's nowhere near um, you know, where we need to be. You can say the same thing about yesterday's core CPI print. You know, it annualizes to almost 4%. So I think until you really see strong evidence that inflation is coming down, right. we continue to hear hawkish comments from the Fed because they need to have credibility to keep inflation expectations in, in check and in order to have, I think, hope of getting inflation pressures back down to target over time. And as we say over time, over what time period do you think is realistic? Ultimately, when we get into the start of 2023, when this market is betting that the Fed is going to be able to cut rates a couple months later, what rate of inflation do you think we will be seeing then? I don't think anywhere near the rate of inflation that the Fed would need to see to cut rates at that point, uh, unless the labor market has really deteriorated and the unemployment rate has, has risen substantially. Uh, if you look at policy rules, you know, any of the ones that the Fed would look at, none of them would call for rate cuts uh, early next year uh, unless inflation were really coming down. We're expecting you still have core PC above 4 percent early next year. We think it ends yeah. this year around 4.5 percent. And so that's still double the, the Fed's objective in year-over-year -year terms. And, yeah. and just very clearly, that's not anywhere near the level that the Fed would uh, cut rates. Matt, you're reading my mind. That's right where I wanted to go, and I actually just brought up the chart. The fact is, 4% inflation, we can enjoy 1990, we can enjoy 1970, and, of course, the massive volatility coming out of World War II and into Korea. Matt Lizzetti, the fact is America has survived 4% inflation before. Will we do it now? Absolutely. I, I think we will see the Fed, uh, you know, achieve their objective over time. Uh, we're confident that the Fed will do what is necessary in order to uh, tame inflation pressures, uh, ensure that we don't have a repeat of, of the 1970s. Um, President Kashkari's comments yesterday, I think we're very clear about that. Um, the key question, I think, and, and it's the ongoing macro debate is, how much pain will that require in the labor market and from a growth perspective? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, can, we continue to think that it will mean that the unemployment rate needs to rise. Uh, and I think the recent wage data, uh, certainly the Well, wait a minute, cost, wait a minute. Is the, is the interview outcome here, Matt Lizzetti, that David Folkers Landau believes in the Phillips curve? I mean, is that what we're saying? I think when you look at what is driving inflation pressures today, there's no doubt an important supply side component. It's in autos. Uh, it has been mm -hmm. in energy. 
But there's also a very important demand side component, um, and that is the component that the Fed needs to act on. It tends to be in services, right. uh, shelter inflation in, in particular. And the Phillips curve, we think, will work uh, in terms of getting okay. inflation down. It was flat pre-COVID. There is some evidence that it's steeping now. Matt Lozzetti, thank you for the brief as well. Lisa, did you think he did well there dodging that question? I think he, <laughs> he did a fabulous Lizzetti's job. We'll try to get a more. Lozzetti's pro. Futures up 29, up. evicts 19.83. It is an up market. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. OPEC expects global oil markets to tip into surplus this quarter. The cartel cut forecasts for the amount of crude it will need to pump in the third quarter by 1.2 million barrels a day. OPEC's outlook may give more insight into the minimal production increase it agreed on last week with its allies. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky says that Russia lost nine fighter planes in explosions that rocked an airbase in occupied Crimea. Russia denies that Ukrainian attacks caused the losses, but the Washington Post says that, in fact, Ukrainian special forces attacked the airfield. The number of student visas given to Chinese nationals has fallen by more than a half compared with pre-pandemic levels. That's according to the Wall Street Journal, citing State Department data. The drop hurts fi finances since at state universities since Chinese students pay out of state tuition. The decline is blamed in part on students' doubts that they would be welcome in the U.S. Disney is raising the price of its flagship Disney Plus streaming service by 38%. It's a part, part in plan to generate more revenue for its money-losing online businesses. The entertainment giant also wants to build on third quarter results that beat estimates for sales, profit and subscriber growth. The world's largest asset manager is making a significant move into crypto markets. BlackRock is offering its first ever investment product directly in Bitcoin. The new private Bitcoin trust seeks to track the price of the biggest cryptocurrency. The firm is responding to demand from large institutional clients. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Markets priced for almost 3% inflation, not just next year, uh, but two years from now. The one-year rate implied by uh, break-evens is, is almost at 3%. So the market's not believing that the Fed has yet done enough to bring inflation down anytime soon. <clears throat> Michael Pond, really good to speak to Michael Pond yesterday about full faith and credit. He has carved out a franchise at Barclays Capital looking at global inflation-linked research, and it was just timely to speak to him with that CPI report. Uh, Lisa, before we, uh, excuse me, Kaylee, before we get to our Lisa show, Kaylee. Body, uh, Lisa me. Kaylee, <laughs> uh, Kaylee, we got to just stop and suggest what the last five days have been since Friday at 8.30 in the jobs report. I think, you know, we in the media are almost benumbed by it. It's it has, been amazing. It has been amazing. A huge tone shift for this market. Resilient yeah. labor market on the mm -hmm. one hand and inflation cooling on the other, both on CPI and PPI. Objectively, are they any means cool? No, but the moderation is much more than expected. Producer price inflation month on month down half a percent, Tom. I don't think anyone yeah. saw that coming. I'm just some math for you here in a minute, but let's bring in Ashok Badia with us now, Deputy CIO of Fixed Income at Newberger Berman with a really twisted view coming out of the Midlands of Chicago, the Midwest of Chicago as well. Ashok, wonderful to speak to you today. Off a of shock of the jobs report, CPI, PPI, my feeling is everybody goes into the weekend and has to recalibrate. How will you recalibrate in fixed income at Newberger Berman? Well, you know, I think the main message, and, you know, this this kind of move, I think, started with, with Powell's press conference and the, really the message that Fed thinks they're broadly at neutral. And if we get the data that supports it, the Fed would like to um, slow down the pace of hikes. You know, inflation is, is you know, we all know is still too high. Fed's going to be dealing with it. But there is a shift from the Fed that if the data allows it, the Fed wants to be a little bit more forward looking, calibrate the pace and, and ultimate destination of hikes to try and get to that, that soft landing. And I think the key message of this week and the payrolls data and then the inflation prints is that window is getting a little bit larger. So the Fed has got a little bit higher probability of being able to, to nail that soft landing. 
there's the chance that the hikes are going to go down in pace and ultimately the destination we get to. And so if the data continues to cooperate and we have a pretty long you know, window again until September and the next Fed meeting, it's an environment where these trends that you know started um, over the last week, you know, they they've yeah. got some some room to run. The the Dow points move, folks, is seven hundred forty three Dow points with futures this morning off the CPI report in the further news today. Dow futures up two fifty four, SPX up thirty seven tenths of a percent. Are we going to see the same move in bonds? Can all of a sudden you invest for total return? Or are you down in the mailroom there watching the Chicago Cubs and clipping coupons? Which is it? Well, I, I think I'd break it into to treasuries or government bonds and then some of the credit assets. For for government bonds, I mean, I think the, the main message of our view is we're going to go back to a period where bond yields sort of disappear a little bit from the headlines. Um, the days of these 15, 20 basis point moves, they're going to go be, be going down pretty rapidly. We're going to enter a period where rates are going to bounce around probably two and a half to three percent tenure notes, mm -hmm. smaller moves, devolatization. For credit markets, and this is not investment grade, investment grade credit, mortgages, there's still more room for, for we think, these spreads to tighten. Probably at this point, you know, best opportunities are in the non-investment grade market, but also things like, you know, short maturity, financials, and bank securities. So here, I think, you know, Tom, on your question of total return, um, there's more total return right now, we think, coming from, from some credit uh, income and credit spread tightening than that we'll see a big drop in interest rates from these levels. Ashok, I want to stick on treasuries for a moment because for a second day, we're seeing the curve steepen out. Two's tens now at just negative 39 basis points. So we're back north of negative 40. Brian Weinstein and Morgan Stanley started off our show in the 6 a.m. hour saying we could go to negative 1%, 100 basis points between twos and tens. How likely do you think that is? Uh, I think that's pretty unlikely anytime soon. I mean, I think, you know, our, our view is that inflation is coming down. And, you know, for year end this year, it's something with a five handle. And this is referencing core CPI. And for next year, it's, you know, something with a three handle. So there's a substantial fall in inflation likely coming over the next 18 months. And that ultimately, we think, means the Fed doesn't have to, you know, push, continue to, to take the funds rate another 200 basis points higher or something like that. So mm -hmm. if the funds rate kind of ends in the zip code, we think it's most likely to maybe something with, you know, a high 3% type of number. That's a remaining an inverted curve, but I would say it's it's probably a level that's closer to these levels or a little higher than than those larger numbers. Ashok, one more question, if if, if we could now, and this comes from a, a research show. Michael McKee, thank you for forwarding this to me. Are Eliza Winger and Anna Wong in Bloomberg Economics reaffirm a doubtful chance of being in recession now, but there's still that angst out well into next year? How does fixed, um, fixed income, Ashok, react to that? If, if we say things are better now, and we clearly see that in the data, how do you then place long-term bond capital believing in stresses that could be out there a year from now? So I think there's two main points. And one is, and this debate is, is going to be coming in the bond market, is real recession versus nominal recession. There's a big gap, as, as we all know, between nominal GDP and real GDP right now. So is the chance that we get to zero to one percent real GDP, you know, possible, likely? Uh, yeah. Um, but that's still with where inflation is likely to be a higher nominal GDP environment than we're used to. And, you know, one point is that's a bit more supportive for a range of credit yeah. markets than than the opposite. And the second is it, it's hard to get a recession when, you know, we're getting these types of job gains and the U.S. is a big economy. Um, could we see something that's, um, you know, a, a small slowdown, small negative right. GDP? Absolutely. But some of the, the larger issues, we're not we're not right. putting a, a high probability on them right now. Oh, Shark, thank you so much. My people talk to your people. And, and we do make note that you're missing John terribly and asking <laughs> you know, on a day to day <laughs> basis how how we get back from. Farrell coming back Tuesday, no, Tom, I can't get out of NAP. And now he was at FCO in Rome. I don't know where he is now, someplace well, I, moving. I hope, he, I hope he gets back. We, we're hoping he gets yeah. back. And, you know, you know, it's like E.T. come home, except it's just yeah. John. They look the same, actually. John, <laughs> uh, come home. Thank you so much with Newberger Berman. Uh, greatly appreciate that.
Kaylee, what I think is so important here, and I want to go back to my headline of the day, which I stole from Ira Jersey because I've never come up with an original headline in my life. Nominal labor income growth is up 9%. How do bad things happen when you have 9% nominal income growth? Well, that's the thing, Tom. If we're watching wages, at what point is people being paid higher wages in order to be able to pay the higher prices they are failing in their daily life a good thing? And at what point is it a bad thing because it potentially leads to a wage price spiral? It's something we're going to have to continue to watch. But today, Tom... I'm watching this market across asset classes, a cool PPI print, weaker right dollar now. for a second day, Tom. Equities on the rise, bull market, NASDAQ 100, that continues. Let me give you the equity markets here. Very, very important. Uh, SPX here up eight tenths of a percent. Dow as well, 33 points on S&P. Dow up 270 points. And NASDAQ 100 blisters up eight tenths of a percent, up 108 points, 13,000. 500. That's a wow move.